then I will, yeah, then we can uh, start, I'll introduce the speakers. And then we'll have brief remarks from uh, our chief guest, which, who is Professor Margaret Hutchinson. And, uh, and then we have a, a short presentation. Let me just, uh, are you, let me share my screen. I want to just show you uh, how the program is gonna be so that I'm not talking to myself. So we'll have uh, the stage setting by uh, our chair, Nora. Then I'll introduce the speakers and have remarks from our chief guest, Professor Hutchinson is on the line. We have a brief video, which is uh, just capturing the recent uh, uh, clip on, on GMOs uh, on one of our TV stations. Okay. Then, we'll, when, then, we'll, then we'll proceed to the lead presentation, starting with Dr. Catherine okay. okay. Racha, mm -hmm. followed by Dr. Yeah. Lorenzo Mogo, and then Dr. James uh, Rhodes from South Africa. Um, and then the poll results of what you are just polling now will be projected so that we get to know your level of knowledge and uh, what comes to mind when we talk about GMO. Then after the presentations uh, and that poll, we'll have a brief q and for the lead speaker. So prepare questions. Uh, and we also have, a, so there's a QA and a uh, function which uh, you can use uh, to you know, write your questions so that they can be picked up uh, instead of putting them in the chat box, use the Q&A function. Uh, and then we'll have a, a second round of poll after the Q&A session where those questions will be posted in the poll. After that, we'll see the poll results, which will also help us in the preceding uh, panel discussion where we have five, uh, we have six panelists uh, who will present, uh, we'll give the three minutes remark uh, about the topic, and then uh, we'll have a panel discussion after that. And then we'll have a final poll, seeing how much we have changed your level of knowledge after this panel discussion. Then at the end of it, we'll have a parting shot or uh, you know, a takeaway message from the panelists, one minute each. And then we'll have uh, Anna Indeche uh, uh, giving us the takeaway messages from the from the from the webinar, and then we'll have closing closing remarks in a way forward, which will be presented by the chair of the team that was organizing this webinar. So, uh, without much ado, I want to welcome uh, our chair, um, Dr. Nora Ndege, to give her brief remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jen Ambuko. I just want to welcome all of you to this very important uh, webinar. So the Kenyan chapter of African Women in Agriculture Research uh, and Development is a professional organization of agricultural scientists. And our role is to advance the empowerment of African scientists, national research agricultural institutions, academia, uh, communities, to really better respond to the needs of uh, the communities that we serve at the local level. And our mission is to contribute to improved and sustainable agriculture production, productivity, and commercialization in Kenya through various uh, collaborations, uh, research, innovation, policy, and advocacy. So KWAD, uh, which is the Kenyan chapter of African Women in Agricultural Research Development, is really dedicated to empowering agricultural communities. And so we are running a set of a series of webinars, this being our first, to discuss contemporary issues um, in the Kenyan context. And of course, this issue should inform uh, you know, ideally uh, regional uh, perspectives and even at the global level. So today's webinar aims to educate and create awareness around different uh, and the multiple and diverse pathways around food and nutrition security. And the theme is really to explore the various pathways, particularly uh, looking uh, and delving in depth at the role of genetically modified organisms. So in our room and in our midst, we have leading experts in biotechnology, uh, policy makers, farmers, uh, proponents and opponents of uh, uh, GMOs, and of course, wider stakeholders. So in terms of the objectives, we look at the various challenges and status of food and nutrition security in Kenya, who raise awareness about GMO and their contribution to food and nutrition security, and of course, highlight various safety and regulatory mechanisms in place. So I just want to welcome all of you 
uh, feel free to interact and engage. And we hope that these conversations will be able to inform, uh, you know, what's happening even at the local level. And so that our communities are more aware in terms of what pathways uh, would support food and nutrition uh, security. So very much welcome and uh, engage and interact on the chats. Uh, back to you, uh, Professor Ambuko. Uh, you're muted. Maybe you can unmute yourself. You're still muted. All right, sorry, sorry about that. So <laughs> this is how when uh, technology gives you a challenge. I wanted to thank you, Nora, for giving that high level um, uh, introduction about keyword. So I just want to kind of introduce the speakers that we have today. Uh, like you said, um, we have a, a very good mix of uh, speakers. Um, I just want to are you seeing my screen? Yes. All right. So we have our pin this way. So we have our our chief guest, Margaret Hutchinson. We have a Professor Dr. Florence Obobo. I'll pin this when they start to speak. We have a Dr. Catherine Taracha from Cairo. Put it in presentation mode. Yeah, okay, right, right, right. Sorry, 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 sorry about that. So we have, uh, so we have Dr. Catherine Taraja from, from Carlo, who will be presenting about uh, she, she's, a, she's a biotech person, but she'll be giving us a general perspective about uh, you know the challenges to food and nutrition security while uh, Pro Dr. Wambubu will actually uh, look at the role of GMOs in addressing food and nutrition security and then we have uh, Dr. Rhodes, uh, James Rhodes from South Africa who will be sharing experiences from South Africa where GMOs are already uh, you know um, have already uh, already been uh, the, I mean they in news people like consuming, they're producing and consuming. We have Dr. Mary Mabel uh, Mwale from the Ministry of Agriculture, who is uh, in charge of the food security docket at the, at the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, I'll pin this later so that you read their bios very well. Then we have Dr. Roy Mugira, who is from NPA, the National Bar Safety Authority, and uh, he'll be you know, telling us issues about why we shouldn't worry about uh, GMOs, that we, we, it's, it's the Mbele Eco Sour. We be telling us about that. We have Dr. Mr. Moana Siali. I hope he's joined. I haven't seen him yet, but he's a farmer. He's representing the farmer. They say the farmer is king. Without farmer, we won't eat. So Noah's voice is here to represent many farmers in his in, in, in his organization. You have Dr. Andrew Edewa, who is a food uh, safety. Dr. Professor Douglas Miano, who is an academia from University of Nairobi, also a biotech expert, uh, who is a virologist, again, bringing the voice of research in academia to the discussion. We have Lydia Timani, who is an agriculture economist, but uh, really uh, active in the uh, issues of trade and SES. So, again, another voice from the civil society. And what is our speakers? What are our speakers who will be listening to today? So, um, I want to give this, oh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jane Amuko. I'm a, a professor of horticulture from Western Nairobi, and I'm a fellow of an award fellow. I'll be, I'm honored to be moderating this uh, discussion, and we look forward to very fruitful uh, discussions. So without much ado, I want to welcome our chief guest, Professor Margaret Hutchinson. Thank you for joining us all the way from South Africa. Uh, though uh, she's she's uh, from Kenya, but she's joining us from South Africa. Welcome, uh, Professor Margaret Hutchinson, to give your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jenambuko, uh, for 
that introduction and uh, may I take this opportunity to pass my greetings from South Africa, the land of GMOs. I have eaten up quite a bit for the last two days. And uh, just to appreciate a word where I have been a mentor for many years until I think this year when I couldn't continue. And uh, also closely uh, the Kenya chapter of the award. I want to thank Professor Ambuko again for the invitation and also um, for being patient with me because we are supposed to go to Cape Town to meet our, to meet our vice chancellors, but I said, I will honor this very important panel and also this discussion. I want to appreciate all the speakers and also those who are attending the webinar. And just to appreciate that uh, we've come from very far as scientists. For many of us who are in the space of food and nutrition security, you will all agree that um, in, in Kenya specifically, because that is where we are discussing today, food and nutrition security has, in my own thinking, become a paradox in the sense that it continues to be quite elusive despite the number of inputs, whether it is the technical staff, whether it's extension services, whether it is the body of knowledge, whether it's the breeders. I think there's so much that has been put, but food and nutrition security from where I stand continues to be elusive, uh, continues to be a challenge. And I think fast forward to 2022, uh, it has been pronounced by government that we are having the worst drought in 40 years. Indeed, climate change is here with us. And therefore, as we have looked for different technologies on how to solve the farmers' challenges, the country's challenges, uh, from policy to practice, uh, we then, in about uh, in the 19, in 1946, the issue of GMO first hit the table in the sense that uh, in 1946, then the scientists discovered actually DNA can be transferred between organisms. And from there, I think 1983, we had the first GMO crop. Many things have happened between 1983 and 2022 when we're having this amazing webinar and to continuously thank uh, the Kenya chapter of our world for organizing this. 2022 was also very unique because it was the time when our president lifted the 10 year ban on the GMOs in Kenya. And so when GMO entered the stage as scientists, we were quite excited that we had not necessarily a silver, a silver bullet, but we had a technology that would address some of the very pressing issues, whether it's drought tolerance, whether it's pest uh, tolerance, uh, whether it is even uh, inserting proteins into different plants and animals. We thought we had something that was so beautiful. Then I'm not sure when we first started to have the controversies around GMOs. But one thing I can tell from where I sit is that this is really shrouded. GMOs are shrouded in a lot of truths, a lot of myths. And to the point where I think we're almost divided in the middle. And I don't know whether it is even in the naming of the genetically modified organism. So that the Puritans of the conservative nature who say, that you should leave nature the way God created and stop interfering with it could have been one of the issues, just the naming of genetically modified organisms. I'm not sure. Because then there's a very huge body that say you should not interfere with mother nature. And of course, scientists, we have not come into the GMO space with clean hands because there were some technologies that gave us amazing results, whether it was DDT, whether it was 24D, whether it was 24T, whether it's a Roundup, that then have been found to be carcinogenic. We are then dealing with also serious pesticide poisoning. And the debate is between now the developing versus the developed countries, the private sector versus government versus the consumers. And the mix is quite tricky. 
And there could be some unknown also in the sense that we do not know everything, even as scientists, even as, as communities, there's quite a bit of knowledge gap to the point where if somebody tells you, oh, you know, GMOs are going to create super bugs, you are going to transfer antibiotic resistance, toxicity, allergenicity, and oh, you know, you're going to have a lot of pressure on the minor pests that can then become major in the future. future. Okay, you can have pest resistance being transferred to the weed relatives. And then of course, who is funding our research? Are our hands clean? Are the business community coming into this space with the consumer safety at heart? Are there serious geopolitical dynamics that are driving the GMO agenda? And the story could go on and on. But one thing, to note is that there has been so much progress in terms of safety, in terms of testing, in terms of setting up regulatory frameworks, in terms of policies on labeling and enabling the consumers to make choices are available in many countries. Kenya, we are yet to inquire and do we have adequate communication by our research community? As Professor Amtugo, who's my friend also, on another front mentioned that if you are told to speak in Kiswahili and the local language, will your farmers know what exactly you are doing or are they just going to say, oh, my, my children are very educated but they have no clue what we are talking about. Is the communication adequate? Have we done participatory research? Or do we just have a normal distribution of a very vocal uh, conservative population my desire and my prayer is that this webinar will continue to build on the body of knowledge so that this platform is not just another ticking of the box but becomes a platform where we are listening to one another more and i guess every none of us has a permanent position we can hear what the scientists are saying as consumers we can hear what the farmers are saying, we can hear what the consumers are saying to the scientists and so forth. So I'm praying that this platform of very diverse, very qualified, very amazing um, panels that you have chosen, that this will be a place of reasoning, that we can move towards having facts on the table and also agreeing that there are areas of research that we need to have. And so for me, as we desire to make a difference in our communities, in our country, what do we need to do so that from the entire value chain, from when we start our farms to when we bring to the table, that we are talking safety, we are talking productivity, we are talking as one and leaving no one behind in the GMO uh, debate. If I make, I, I like the word dialogue because this is not a debate where we are saying who spoke the best, but we are having a dialogue. And so my prayer is that this webinar will achieve much more than what we even planned before. And I want to wish every last one of us very fruitful deliberations and look forward to uh, having the webinar outputs and how we can continue to engage. Because I don't think this webinar will be the last, but will be a first maybe among us as women, uh, scientists, women uh, in aggregate development, but also reaching out to our stakeholders and saying, let us not leave anyone behind. So may the Lord bless each one of you, every participant, every presenter, every organizer, may the Lord bless the works of your hands. Over to you, Professor Ambuko. And I'm so sorry, please, I'm happy that you are taping because I have to run, we are going to Cape Town now, but I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, coming from the University of Nairobi where we are committed for to be a world-class university, committed to scholarly excellence, and also wanting research to drive the agenda of teaching and learning. And therefore we want to create, to transmit, to integrate knowledge as a university, but also as a community of scientists that we move this together and leave no one behind. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hutchinson. You should have been also one of the speakers. You know too much about GMO. 
<laughs> so yeah, thank you for sparing time. I know you are on the road and you had to delay the trip just to be with us in this opening. So we truly appreciate. And thank you for you know giving us your blessings so that we proceed and for sure, um, like you asked, I'm sure this will not just be another webinar, but we'll have tangible outputs that we can so share. Allow me then, Professor yes. Hambuko, to say it's my pleasure to declare the webinar officially open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a blessed day. So thank you. I know we are already uh, running behind schedule uh, as planned. So um, Geoffrey, if you may, you could play uh, our the little clip we thought we those of us who probably missed Geoffrey please be setting up the clip we agree that um, uh, well when you talk about food security in Kenya obviously I, I don't want to be part of those people who say food security means maize but well that is the truth in Kenya is that when you hear food security uh, you are almost certain that there's a shortage of maize or there's a problem affecting production of maize and so we'll forgive us if we look too biased towards maize, but yes. So we have this uh, set, uh, this uh, little clip uh, to just tell us, set the stage for us, what is going on uh, on the issue of uh, genetically modified maize. This was on Citizen. If you missed it, here it is for you. Uh, Geoffrey, please. And Kenya is set to commercialize biotech maize from March next year. Researchers at the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization, CalRO, say the country has moved a step closer in adopting the improved maize variety, which is expected to boost yields and cut reliance on pesticide use. Very own Dennis Satiano has more on this week's Smart Farm. <laughs> From afar, this maize crop that has been undergoing trials since June this year at Kalro Kiboko Research Center in Makweni County may seem like a wasted crop. But a closer look reveals a different picture. James Karanja, a maize breeder at Kalro, confirms that this is genetically modified maize, whose seeds will now be released to farmers from March next year, coinciding with the long rainy season. The technology is here only to help our farmers save that shearing that our farmer that has been using to buy the chemicals to spray and control against the insect and also will also save the farmer from the health health wise because of the use of the chemicals and also we are also guaranteeing our farmer that the maize that we are going to get it will be of the good quality the maize variety has been modified to include a gene from the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium that provides insect protection. It is expected to help farmers improve yields and control pests without chemical insecticides. Some of the technology that we use are not new. They are the technologies that our farmers have been using. If you look at, the, for example, the BT maize or the BT technology, this BT is just a bacteria that is naturally occurring which all of us, we know we have consumed when we have been eating the, the, the root tubers, the carrots, and also the sweet potatoes and the yams. And this is also a bacteria that has also been used by even our organic farmers in the control of the pest. So what the scientists have done, they say, why can't we save the farmer from using the chemical the sprays and put that protection within the maize? According to scientists at Calro, cultivating Bt maize has a number of benefits, which include doubling of maize productivity from 8 to 17 bags per acre to between 28 to 35 bags per acre, improving grain quality by reducing rotten grains and reducing the annual 4 to 12 million bags of maize imports. We are seeing a bright future because a country can only develop by an taking advantage of more modern technologies and therefore enhancing our productivity and uh, the country gets in value for the investment, the value for money. The next stage is for the developers, for this case Calvo, to go to KFIS for varietal uh, registration. Then from there, 
uh, I think what will follow is seed uh, bulking and then finally it is distributed to the farmers to, to cultivate. The recent move by the government to lift a ban on GM crops has elicited debate among proponents and opponents who have expressed concern about the human and environmental safety of the technology. Successful commercialization of VT maize will see Kenya join 29 other countries around the world that are already cultivating the improved crop. Denis Otieno, Citizen TV, Kiboko, Makweni County. <laughs> So there you have it. That was our clip to just uh, set the stage for us. Uh, if it look like we're biased toward maize because we can't talk about everything, but we will focus because this is a, a lot about food security and there will be other crops that we'll talk about. I just need to emphasize from the onset that um, contrary to what I've had some people imagine, uh, this webinar is in no way meant to promote GMOs, but to raise awareness about, uh, you know, by engaging the experts so that they can shed light uh, on GMOs, especially in light of the recent uh, lifting of the ban on GMOs by the government of Kenya. So we want to hear all opinions. Huh? So we want to hear all the opinions. We want to, I know our panelists may have opinion and may people say this uh, pro-GMO. No, we are having a dialogue. So I know in our audience, we have people who are probably have some reservations. We want to hear your voices. So we want to hear everything, the good, the bad, the beautiful and the ugly. We want everything, but we are not here to propagate myths and fiction. We want facts. So let us engage from a point of factual information. Let us just know that it is not, this is not a propaganda. Uh, webinar to promote anybody. We are award fellows, award fellow, award Kenya, who are the host of this uh, webinar actually has everybody, the pro, the anti, and the neutral. So we want to hear everything, okay? So uh, without much ado, I want to invite our speakers, uh, the three uh, uh, presenters, so that they can uh, shed some light uh, from their own perspective, starting with uh, Dr. Catherine Taraja, who is a biotech, yes, but we told her we do not want her to tell us about her biotech. We want her to tell us about the challenges that are facing our food, uh, food production and food security in general. So Catherine, please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I have to switch off my camera because of bandwidth. As Catherine prepares to present, please note that we have a poll that is going on. There are two poll questions that you will find in the chat box. Please click on the link and, uh, and, and, and take the poll uh, so that we'll hear the result just before, just before we go to the discussion. Sir. So Catherine, please go on. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jane, and welcome everybody. I'm just going to talk about the challenges um, in, uh, of agriculture in Africa. Now, um, in Africa, uh, we have a very big population, but it's expected to skyrocket. And um, it's expected to increase from um, an estimate that was made in 2013. At that time, the population was estimated to be 1.1 billion. And it's expected to skyrocket to 2.4 billion in 2050. In terms of arable land that we use for agriculture, it's predicted that by 2030, 30 to 60 million hectares of arable land will be converted to non-agricultural use. We are talking about maybe uh, commercialization, urbanization, and this will be a big uh, demand on our ag agriculture. Now, what are the challenges in Africa? I'm just going to go through a few major ones. We have climate change, and we've been experiencing it here in Kenya where there's a lot of drought. So the frequency and severity of extreme climatic conditions that are droughts, which we're experiencing, floods, tropical storms, and wildfires, contribute to decline in crop yields and have a great consequence 
on agriculture, agricultural production and food security. You can see on the left hand side, the kind of drought we've been experiencing and sometimes the extreme end of flooding where which makes sure that we our agricultural production is actually reduced. Now, um, climate change um, affects our agriculture, but we find that agriculture also affects climate change. So it's a, it's a circle. You find that there's manufacturing of uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, and these industries actually use fuel. And these fossil fuels contribute to the greenhouse gases. When we go to tilling our land, we have fuels that are used, especially when we're using tractors, again, emitting greenhouse gases. When we come to our agriculture, our animal agriculture, you find cattle actually emit a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, in terms of millions of tons, uh, cattle emit 5,024 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, followed by pigs, right down to small ruminants and even our poultry emit these greenhouse gases, which then contribute to climate change. So there we have a cycle. We also have uh, pests and diseases that normally just uh, attack our agricultural crops. But more recently, we've been getting emerging pests and disease. For example, what you can see on the screen, the fall armyworm. The fall armyworm actually um, was um, uh, reported in, in, uh, in, in Nigeria in 2016. And by April 2017, it was reported in Kenya and it had spread to the whole of Africa. It causes damages of up to 100%. There you can just see the adult and the larvae. And the larvae is the most destructive. And normally by the time you get, you get uh, to see the larvae, your crop is completely damaged. We also have emerging diseases like the maize lethal necrosis virus. This is caused by a double infection of two viruses, the maize chlorotic model virus and the sugarcane mosaic virus. When these viruses are um, is singly, they do not cause as much damage. But when they are combined, when the two viruses are combined, they cause losses of up to 100%. And you can just see the type uh, of symptoms we get there, you get your plants are, um, um, are stunted, there's a lot of streaking, and even the grain filling, there's not, the grain, the grain doesn't fill completely. So there's a lot of loss. And um, this virus was first reported in Kenya, in Bomet, and has then um, um, spread to all the counties, and it, it infects all commercial and local varieties, causing losses of between 30 to 100%. So um, maize lethal necrosis virus was first reported in Peru in 1973, and then was reported, first reported in Kenya in 2011. And as I said, it's caused by a combination of two viruses and damage of between 30 to 100%. Another challenge, to agriculture is soil fertility. We know as we till our land, there's a lot of soil erosion. Then we find that we normally have a lot of crop nutrient mining. We put in, I mean, we plant our maize or whatever crop, and we normally remove more nutrients that we put in. So this causes, after a long time, we get crop nutrient mining. Then there's the continuous cropping system. You find the farmers, if they are planting, for example, maize, they are always planting maize, they're always planting beans. It's a continuous cropping system and they do not change the cropping system. Once our farmers uh, harvest their produce, do you find this complete removal of residue? They do not plow it back into the land and this causes 
a lot of nutrient mining. And as I said, soil erosion. Another challenge is post harvest losses. You find that the farmer works so hard to produce his um, crops, but often the post harvest losses exceeds more than 50% of the harvest crop. And why is this? It's because of poor harvest pr practices. Even as he harvests his produce, you find he's damaging it, he's bruising it. And then there's inadequate post handling post-harvest handling management, that is poor storage methods, poor packaging, et cetera. Another cause of post-harvest losses is unorganized traditional supply chains that exist and limited market infrastructure. And also post-harvest losses are caused by poor processing practices. For those farmers that actually process some of their produce, their poor processing practices. And you can see from the picture there, there's a lot of waste. The farmer works so hard to produce the food, but then it is all lost uh, after harvest. So with that small introduction, you can see that there are so many challenges in agriculture and that need to be attended to so that we can have food security, food and nutrition security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for keeping using less than uh, your time, which is great. So we save time because we want more time for, for discussion. Thank you for shedding light on the issues uh, affecting our food security. Uh, I want us to just, um, have the three presentations, then we can have a Q&A after that. So kindly, uh, we can have uh, uh, Dr. Wambugu uh, presenting and uh, Geoffrey kindly project uh, the slides for uh, Dr. Wambugu so that uh, then she can speak as you, as you move the slides for her. Thank you for, for, for saving time. And so Dr. Wambugu, uh, you also have 15 minutes. <laughs> if you okay. can do it less and save us time, we will still accept so that we have more for discussion. So welcome, uh, Dr. Ari. Thank you so much, Jane, for having me. And um, I thank you for the uh, Professor Hutchinson who gave us a very good opening remarks. And uh, uh, Catherine has also set some very good stage eh? on truly we do need technologies. Uh, let me have some slides. I can't see them on the screen. Somebody is putting them for me. I can't see them on the screen. Yeah, I'll just be very precise. Um, a small introduction, which, oh, okay. Just put the slide back, please. Geoffrey, please, uh, uh, is there a problem with projection? Geoffrey, you have a problem with, okay, there you are. Thank you, uh, brief introduction. Uh, let me just uh, give you a brief introduction about myself uh, because I feel like I should not be in this debate, I should leave it to others. But when I saw Professor Hutchinson, I said, uh, thank you so much for inviting me because I believe this uh, discussion is two, 20 years old. We started this in 1981, 1984, but let me say I went to, United States um, in 1992, in fact, 1992, I went December 1990. And for three years, 91, 92, 93, I was a postdoc, literally doing genetic engineering on the bench. So probably among uh, those people, I'm not the only one, I'm sure many Kenyans have joined. By the time I was doing genetic engineering, uh, there was a the beginning of this technology. So from a practical point of view, I'm among those who have been on the bench for three years, but then we do not have a lot of these, uh, how to say, automatic uh, sequences and so on. And so um, a lot have changed, but I was still able to do, produce some products. Um, again, I'll say uh, the reason we are doing GM uh, technology, and even when I was in the bench there, I was engineering the system to sweet potato as a biology background is plant pathology biologist looking for, for solution to reduce the yield losses in sweet potato because 
is one of the crop where the yield losses are very, very high because of the virus and where there is no natural resistance to that. Um, and so um, the science business is for crop improvement, identifying the genes that, uh, for example, in sweet potato, we're looking for control of sweet potato feather remotovirus, which reduces a lot of yield. And the same, uh, Catherine has just uh, really expounded all the projects, problem we have that can be, many of them can be solved by, 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 by genes that can be transferred using gene technology. Uh, because to me, when they come to this technology, it's literally moving information or, 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 or try to, to kind of vaccinate the plant. Again, there's some of these, uh, some, some of the insects, even what there was, was another explained area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, given the high level of poverty, malnutrition, hunger, food security problem, low agriculture productivity in Kenya and Africa, advanced technology like GM have the potential solution to some of these problems. The question people ask, why are you using this? Look, the whole world, if you look at cotton, um, you can hardly fight cotton that's not BT. We are going to China, India, uh, Argentina, uh, US, Canada. Uh, this is a not technology uh, that has not been used. We are not a guinea pig or anything. And they, are, they use this to resolve the problems that they had. Uh, when Kenya, our peers went to, went to for, uh, for maize in Latin America or to no control for farm home, they found what they use as BT. The whole of Latin America uses BT technology uh, to actually get uh, control for the, for the farm home. So it's not something new. So despite the, the, the controversies, um, technology is not 20 years in use. It's gone almost many, many countries, including African countries, as I show you, because it helped the farmers use less land, fewer inputs, less energy, or producing food needed to meet the world demand. We need food in this country. We need cotton. We need to return back cotton. We need to do many things. It's to, it is a technology to solve problems. Um, that's why it's being embraced, why it's being used. The GM technology has less production of crops tolerant to various biotic stress, soil tolerance, aluminium, which allows cultivation. And anyway, it's happening here in the country, like in the maize we are seeing in Kiboko. You don't have to go to China or Latin America to see uh, BT maize it's here in Kenya. Next slide, please. Thank you. Potential for GM crop genetic engineering can improve yield that we have seen already, uh, even here in Kenya targeting crops. Science can also engineer pest resistance, uh, help farmers with study environmental challenges, uh, which we already defining that crop, even um, engineer the more nutritious uh, and uh, vitamins. That one truly work Africa harvest and partners are done for years. We already have sorghum that is genetically engineered with the vitamin A, iron and zinc, very high levels that can control malnutrition for sorghum. And sorghum, you know, is a crop that uh, uh, it's, it's going to be very useful as we become, as more and more weather changes happen. Um, adoption of GM crops, US, it is sorted to the, uh, to the, if you look at the adoption of GM crops in US has resulted in first as youth reduction. I mean, we are talking about reduction of 46.4 million, uh, million pounds of pest reduction. And that is 2002. Uh, use of BT in China has resulted in pesticide use reduction to 78,000 tons of formulated pesticide in 2001. You can imagine what's happening. It's, it's really technology that is in use. It's not something which we are debating. Has it been used? Has it been tested? Is anybody else using it? Okay. So and I think these are the points I want to raise in this discussion at the dialogue. Um, thank you. Let's move on. Next. Next slide. Uh, again, we are talking about uh, nutrition, Africa by 45 sorghum, that's Africa harvest, and the cotiva and the many partners, including curry, including ICRISAT, including uh, 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 AATF. Uh, we have golden rice, which is vitamin A and rich for Europe, and in fact, Africa could be used. Uh, producing uh, GM can help produce more nutrition, enhance uh, quality food for growing population food insecurity and reduction, income, traditional low income systems, subsistence systems, sub-Saharan Africa. This one, we just need to look at India, great impact in India. 
allowed up tolerance soya bean can be granted with no till, eliminate uh, dust and conservation and, and conserves water. These are things that have been applied in Brazil in a big time. So any statement here can be substituted by literature at the place where it has been done. That is the, the, the kind of discussion we need to bring. These are not mother statements or, or possibility. There are things being done with a track record of more than five years, mainly free presentation and journals. Agriculture economists have analyzed the benefits. And I think that's what I want to share. Next. This is a big list. You may not be able to see it. But the actual issue status of GM technology adoption in Africa, in terms of countries doing research, and there's not, uh, I'm going to show you the next slide, is which have been commercialized. If you go to Burkina Faso, you go to find the cowpea uh, insect uh, resistance, and there'll be cotton and all that. Ethiopia is using maize resistant to drought, uh, Ghana rice, cowpea, maize. Kenya, you have a whole history of things have been, uh, uh, these are, some are in contained field trials, they're not necessarily released, but this is what is going on. In this country, we have sorghum, potato, cotton, sweet potato, maize, uh, maize for different uh, uh, things, drought, some maize for insects. Um, but they will even have banana resistant to, I don't know which disease. That shows the level of, uh, of research going on in this country from universities, Carroll universities, private sector, I don't know, but it really shows it's not something that is out there in a certain company. It's happening right here in Kenya. Malawi, cowpea, banana. banana. Malawi, they are controlling banana bunch of virus. It wiped all the, all the banana in Malawi. So they are rehabilitating using this technology. Mozambique, there is maize. Nigeria, sorghum, cassava. Cassava again for two different things. First, cassava is, uh, uh, cassava is composition. Uh, and then uh, the second cassava is the season to cassava mosaic virus. The, Nigeria is doing rice also. And I know Nigeria is also doing cowpea. Uh, South Africa, a whole is there. Sugarcane uh, for one thing, and the sugarcane there, cassava, maize, uh, cotton, uh, soya bean, sugar, South Africa has a lot of crops. Uh, Tanzania, there is maize going on research there for insects. Uganda is rice, cotton, I see rice, I see potato. Potato, I'm sure, is virus, there's maize, and bobiti, there's maize, there's cassava, banana, banana again. There's a lot of research in Uganda, but they have not tried to commercialize or try to, to move further again. So maybe Kenya most you help the, the regional countries to move forward. Uh, that shows you just the amount of research going on. And this is important for debate. Put that slide back. So stand that slide back. Discussion, dialogue. The question is, is this happening or is all foreign, all these foreigners telling us this? This you can go to Cali or to university or where and, 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 and engage. And that's important because this discussion was like, all oh, this thing is foreign driven. But this is happening to our borders here in, in, in Kenya or in Nigeria or Malawi or Mozambique or South Africa. And I think we need to internalize. This is an African technology, not just a foreign technology. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, status of GM technology adoption in Africa. I think this is important because we're going to now take that big risk and try to diagonalize it. Where you see the star is GM commercialized. Is where crops are being commercialized, they are being eaten, they are being sold, they are doing what? So I see a star in South Africa. There's a star in Sudan. Um, I don't see us. Uh, there's a star in uh, uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, Egypt had started, they went back. Otherwise, in Egypt would also be having star. So where you see stars, there's commercial uh, business involved with the GM technology. When you see green, but no star, is contained few trials and by safety laws exist as nine countries. So three countries are commercialized, nine countries and Kenya is in that. We have contained few trials, we have biosafety laws. Uh, the countries ready to now to move to commercialization. These are nine countries in Kenya. Here I see Egypt, of course, Sudan is commercializing, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Uganda, now Uganda has some stripes, I'll tell you why. Uh, then South Africa is also there. So nine countries are ready to move to the next level within Africa. Then you have contained few trials without safety laws, stripes, I see those stripes in Uganda. Uganda needs help because they have not even got a biosafety law. The green countries have laws 
to regulate. Now, there is the knowledge, they have bisect laws without um, any content few trials. They have laws, but no crops. They haven't moved to the, even to the green out to contain few trials. And then the uh, gray is no bioset loss, no, 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 nothing is happening in terms of contain few trials. Uh, so that gives at least when you, we don't have a blanket. Africa is very diverse. Africa has many countries. And um, because of the political nature of regulating uh, GM crops, that's why these very diverse, I believe these very diverse uh, happenings. The countries next, because I want to save time for discussion. Uh, next is interesting is status of GM technology adoption in African countries, but this one is a bit interesting because number one, uh, I see Eswati, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Sudan, South Africa. These are countries, I see cotton, because even Kenya, by the way, we are creating national trials on cotton. Today, if you listen to the debate this morning that was going on in Citizen with the Minister for Trade there, um, very interesting because uh, he was saying that uh, he's talking to 21 counties which can commercialize cotton. Uh, and, and I thought that was very interesting that government now is talking or people are talking. It's no longer debate. He was saying how Kenya can rehabilitate uh, its own cotton Areas that had nothing, especially now with the drought, had nothing could be commercially using cotton and uh, how use BT cotton. And so I'm really glad Kenya is there because cotton has been tested in this country. I think it's ready for commercialization. But in Kenya, we move really fast to area. So you look at the, re the, the region that the left, uh, and, and Swahili, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Sudan, South Africa, they are going to commercialization. All they have commercialized are almost there. South Africa is on the lead, of course. Nigeria is going to move really fast, and especially, especially I think cotton, maize, and cowpea. And South Africa have been on the lead, almost all crops are there. So they are lead countries. You can't say it's black box in Africa, nobody knows nothing. They are countries that are leading, are already now enjoying the benefits of this technology. Next. Next, please. Uh, my conclusion, the not conclusion, the discussion points, are, let me say, the integral might. Genetically modified foods are safe, are safe, and there's a promise for more nutritious foods. I'm saying this from knowledge that for 20 years since commercialization and eating of GM crops started, there have been not one shred of evidence that the food have been done damage to human environment. All the proofs have been to the opposite, that they have brought uh, most, uh, less pesticide use, better in environment, and provided more nutrition. Of course, that doesn't mean there are no there are, there are no controversies. Controversy there, but if I look for tangible evidence, I've been involved in technology for 20 years. I've never seen one case I've been proven other than controversy that GM crops have been damaging to the environment. They have by and, and safety issues because they are highly, highly regulated like medicine. And the reason why they are so uh, they are they are the limited players because of the cost of our safety. Which is very, very costly because before you commercialize anything, you have to prove it cannot have energy, it can have toxin, it cannot damage the environment, it cannot target anything except that time. If you're dealing with the fall amyworm, you cannot target the fledged insects. They must not be harmed. It's the precision breeding, truly. And, and that's what makes it very costly. Um, now, for more crops, and environmental impacts are similar less than controversial uh, conventional agriculture. It means for some crops, and environmental impacts are similar or less, uh, depending. For example, if you, are, you take a look in cotton, 60% of all the costs in cotton is really just protecting from insects and pests. And that's why I remember when I was going to school, when I was uh, some years back, uh, when of course um, I was going to the school, Kenya had a vibrant cotton business. In fact, we had a, a company producing cotton called Rivertex. Kenya was a cotton producing country. And most of my, my, uh, my Machakos, all that area had cotton. It all disappeared because of the cost of pesticides. And so anything could, uh, this is technology can rehabilitate cotton back. So GM is important tool for breeding. It's a breeder's tool. If you can look at it as a breeder's tool, then we are more positively looking at this. It's a technology to assist breeding. Uh, GM technology can solve problems that can be that uh, that cannot be resolved in other 
ways at present. For example, the work we have done or doing on um, biofortified sorghum, it cannot be done by breeding. Uh, we, it's, we, it's not just used for the sake of being used, it's to help do something that breeders are not able to achieve through traditional breeding. So it's an, ad, an added tool in the toolbox. Uh, our, our work on, 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 on sorghum could not be done by breeding. Uh, and, and I'm saying that's from, from knowledge. The benefits were spread between biotech companies and farmers. Now, there's one way of saying, oh, it will just benefit the big company. Someone was telling me the other day, all oh, these technologies are only controlled by four companies uh, because they are the ones who hold the patents for this and this and this. All farmers will be tied up at this. Now we can look what has happened somewhere else. This technology is in South Africa, is in India, is in Brazil, in where, is in China, is America, where. Uh, it's like, yes, it's true. And to me, I believe there's fewer companies with the, with the patents because of the level of um, uh, the level of uh, of regulatory, it is so costly to regulate, and that's what kept it. Because most of our universities, South Africa, Kenya, where would have produced, had been able to commercialize some of their products, but the cost of regulatory was made very costly by people who were just opposed. So they would add another layer, they would add another layer of regulatory, another unknown this and this. That made it very, very, very costly. And again, it was made political. That made it even more costly. That doesn't mean I have to produce what I, I must control the seed because even the, the hybrid seed we use today, they are owned by Kenya seed. I don't own them. Uh, and I still use them at the benefit. They are benefit sharing between myself and the Kenya seed when I plant their seed. Most of the, uh, the even our current, our current maize or, or what, they are, they, are, they, are, they are owned by a company. That's why company exists to make a profit. And that's why they invest. But if they do not now make it profitable for me, how are they going to benefit? So common sense says, if everybody has been commercializing this, there must be a shared benefit between the producer and the, uh, the user. Now, when you also come to the crops in Kenya, most of this, them have been negotiated royalty free. So we can't use that to say, oh no, oh, we are all going to be controlled, we shall lose control of our seed. We need to diagonize this in a discussion in a very sober way and see that, uh, uh, we come to a conclusion where we don't lose out again. Brazil, for example, they started by negotiating with the companies and then they developed their own technologies. But they are now the lead because they actually did not block the technology, they, they engaged. Next, I think uh, conclusion, I'm there because I want to save time. So GM crops are not a panacea for the problem of hunger and malnutrition. I'm very, very pleased to see our president started by bringing fertilizer. GM crops, he did not say, GM crops is going to solve the problem. He said, first, we need fertilizer. He said, we are going to increase irrigation. Then we are going to use the technology. That's, that's, common, that, that's common sense. That's the way India got a green revolution. They did not solve it by one thing. They, they improved their varieties by breeding. That time, there was no GM technology. That's when Norman Bolo became a, 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 a wild breeder, a late Norman Bolo. He brought high yielding varieties. What is Carol is doing? At the other, at the other, at the partners and private sector. Then the country invested in their fertilizer. Our president said these tough country, countries are going to have a, a, a fertilizer producing factory maybe in future. Then they invested in irrigation. We are talking the same language. You have to irrigate. You have to to bring quality seed. Uh, then you have to train the farmers. You have to mechanize. So it's not a panacea. I don't want the discussion and debate to go, all oh, the scientists are saying that GM technology will solve all the problems. Nobody has said that and nobody's going to say that. We realize there's a problem of fertilizer, there's a problem of droughts, there's all these problems. But this is one thing which you leave out, you're going to suffer. Because if you take a, a, a Maasai cow and you begin to feed it, no matter how it will not produce milk, it's better for something else. If you take a dairy cow, which is our technology, and then you feed it well, then you're gonna have double the yield, which will be a big told here. So I'm not with this, this thing to be told that GM is a panacea is not. Complex problems require multi pro, uh, Thank you, pro doctor. Yeah. Yes, now, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. But the, yes, I uh, think you've already concluded. Oh, okay, thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Wambugo. I think you've already, without reading your slides, you have actually concluded your, thank your you. presentation. Thank, so, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wambugo. Uh, we, I know there are a lot of questions for you, but just wait for them. Uh, some of them are actually, yes, some are, yes, some of them are actually in the chat. Eh? Uh, so, uh, James, as you, you put up your presentation, uh, you can start putting up your presentation. So I, I will encourage our presenters, eh? because time won't allow us to pick all these questions. Some of them you can respond. Uh, some of them will, will flag them out uh, during, because you have a very brief, we've already ex uh, gone beyond our time. So I'll let James present. Uh, James, if you may take less than 15 minutes, uh, would appreciate so that then we can have some time to you know let uh, the discussion, I mean, let's have some kind of discussion with the, with the audience. Uh, James, please. Uh, good morning, uh, a warm welcome from South Africa. Um, so I am from Biosafety South Africa. Uh, we are a platform uh, funded by the South African government and we focus on the safe, sustainable research and development and application of GMOs. So our focus is on safe and sustainable use of GMOs. So I just want to take a step back and talk a little bit about why we regulate GMOs. So the central dogma of genetics, a little bit of genetics here is that we have DNA, which is trans transcribed into RNA, which is translated into a protein, and then it gives you a phenotype. So we can change the phenotypic traits of an organism by introducing genetic variation or by selecting uh, genetic variation. Um, we can do this by trans Inferring specific DNA or changing the genes itself. Um, so this can either be by conventional breeding or artificial selection, uh, mutagenesis, or even you know, GM techniques such as transgenesis or gene editing. So we have natural genetic variation uh, and uh, uh, evolution selects uh, based on the environment, which genes are more uh, frequent in a population. We can artificially select uh, these genes, you know, which we've done with many different uh, plant species and animal species, and we can select these different traits for different features. And we can induce these uh, traits. So on the right hand side, we've got uh, mutagenesis. Um, uh, we use mutagenesis to <clears throat> uh, randomly introduce certain changes and we select the ones that we like. So normal sex sexual selection, you have gametes. Uh, these combine to form an egg or a seed. Uh, and then you have your phenotype in plants. With genetic modification, uh, we use stem cells uh, and we introduce a change, uh, a small change. We know that gene uh, and we introduce that change into the, uh, the gamete and then this introduces a new trait. So it's a small change. We know something about that gene uh, and we introduce it. Um, and by the stage we are working with field crops, we know a lot about that gene, you know, because it has to go through a long uh, process to get there. And I'm gonna go through that. So if you look at risk with zero risk on the left-hand side of the axis and more risky going to the right, we have uh, a fairy land, uh, a princess land. It's, there's no such thing as zero risk in this world. Um, uh, any activity that we do has some level of risk. Uh, so we can never get no risk, uh, but we aim for what we call like, acceptable level of risks. And these are generally not regulated. Then we have a regulated area of risk. Uh, one part is acceptable. And then you have a part which is unacceptable risk. So this is where uh, you want to be when you're working with GM crops because GM crops are highly regulated, but you want to make sure that you're working within an acceptable level of risk. And then we need to make sure it's as safe as the conventional variety. So when we're looking at, at characterizing and evaluating risks of GMOs, we are not 
evaluating all GMOs, but we are specifically looking at a specific GMO with a specific trait or group of traits. And this is what we do, the risk analysis to make sure it's safe to eat and safe to grow in the environment. So in South Africa, uh, we have three uh, GM crop varieties or three GM crop uh, species, uh, maize, cotton, and soybean. And as you can see, we have very high adoption rates. So the farmers clearly see the benefit to growing GM crops, uh, the ones that have been released. Uh, it's just three traits. So it's herbicide tolerance, insect resistance, and more recently, uh, water stress tolerance. So internationally, there are many, many, many different types of GMOs with a wider uh, group of traits, uh, including uh, GM animals. Um, and I've noticed in this discussion, you know, we're talking about the controversies around GMOs, but I would just like to draw the attention to the fact that the controversies around uh, GM crops, uh, we use this GM technology uh, in a number of other products, uh, including uh, GM medicines, almost all the ins insulin produced in the world and available is made through uh, GM techniques. Uh, many or almost all of our uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are used for cancer treatments, and interferons, again, used for cancer treatments, are uh, recombinant DNA technology, so GM technology. Um, and almost all the cheese that uh, we make uh, in the world uh, is made with rennet, which is made using GM techniques. So the controversy then is around GM crops, but we need to realize that we use uh, the same technology safely in other areas. And we also use it in, in industrial applications as well. So our South African regulatory system dates back to uh, 1979, where uh, uh, we had a committee that uh, regulated GM activities. Uh, then it was uh, modified under an Agricultural Pest Act. Act. Um, the big change uh, came in when we had an act looking exclusively at GMOs called the GMO Act. And this came into force back in 1997. Uh, South Africa is also a signatory to that Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And we have had some uh, amendments to the GMO Act to make sure it uh, complies with uh, the Cartagena Protocol. We also have uh, strategies, biotech strategies and bioeconomy strategy that have been released. We also have a public understanding of biotechnology program uh, to interact and liaise with the public. And we've had some uh, regulatory challenges, which I'm gonna speak about in a second, such as in-field BT resistance, how we handle stacks and new breeding technologies. Uh, we've also had a couple of surveys on, on understanding of biotechnology in South Africa. So the GMO Act uh, is the overarching act uh, governing uh, the research and development of GMOs. However, uh, there are a number of different acts that also uh, ensure that we have regulate different regulatory me uh, mechanisms overviewing the safety of, of, of GMOs. So the Department of Health uh, has the Foodstuffs, Cosmetics and Disinfecting Act, Disinfectants Act that oversees food safety and GMOs also fall under that. Uh, we also have Codex, uh, we also have signatory to Codex Elementarius, which is an international convention, uh, which gives guidance on how to uh, ensure the food safety assessments of GMOs. So there's guidance in South Africa uh, complies with, or uses these guidance when doing uh, food safety assessments. There's a number of environmental acts uh, uh, under which GMOs fall. Uh, and we are a signatory on the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And I see that Kenya is also a signatory to that protocol. And that protocol also has some nice guidance on how to do uh, environmental risk assessments for GMOs. Uh, and then there's also socioeconomic uh, legislation under the Consumer Protection Act. 
So our uh, permit application process, uh, we have a number of different steps. I just want to highlight a few important ones. The first is uh, uh, there's a uh, notification requirements for certain activities such as field trials, or commodity clearance or general release. Uh, so the public needs to be made aware of these things. Uh, uh, there's a public participation involved in the process. We have a scientific body that's involved with the process and seven different government departments are involved in the decision making. It has to be a consensus base. So if one of those government uh, departments says no, they, that activity will not go ahead. So there's a number of different uh, departments involved making sure that any decision making ensures that the safety is considered. So the Department of Health and the Department of Environment uh, sit on that body so they make sure that the environmental aspects are considered and that the health aspects are considered. So there's a number of different checks and balances in place. So <clears throat> when GMOs are, are developed, it normally goes through a number of different stages. So first you start in the lab laboratory, you go to a greenhouse, then might take it to field trials, and only then do you get to general release. And during this, so and during this stage, it's contained, so it's easy to manage potential risks because it's within a small contained area. Field trials is very confined, and then you get to commercial general release. And during this process, uh, more and more is learned about the trait, the crop and the environment so that you can address your environmental concerns and your food, healthy food, food health concerns. So by the time you reach commercial stage, you have fully characterized all your risks and you need to make sure that your risks are acceptable. And, and along this way, you, you can manage risks and communicate requirements. So there's various types of permits types for registering your facility, contain use permit. The whole process is highly regulated uh, and it takes a long time to get to the general release stage. So risk analysis is a useful tool that which regulators use uh, to help characterize risks. So I'm not going to go into depth on this slide um, because I can literally speak a week on the slide, we have a training course and we talk about a risk analysis for, for a week. But the important things I want to highlight here is that the orange is driven by society and the green is driven by science. So there's a strong science-based risk assessment done here. But what you want to protect, how you do it, and communication is driven by society. So there's a strong influence of society in this decision-making. Um, so this is a highly iterative process. It, it starts right in the early stages of contained use um, and it's iterative within itself. So <clears throat> I wanna speak a, a little bit about uh, regulatory challenges. So, and how they've been addressed uh, in South Africa. So in 2000, uh, well, first of all, we adopted BT Maze in 1997. And one of the, the concerns is that the insects are going to develop resistance to the BT trait. Uh, so there are various requirements in place. You need to uh, grow refugia. Uh, to minimize the likelihood of this developing. Um, and as part of the permit uh, requirements, you need to uh, report and monitor if you see resistance developing. So in 2007, uh, farmers started noting in some areas resistance to uh, the BT crop. Um, however, because they noticed it early, there was uh, management that they took place, they uh, sprayed with pesticides uh, and eventually replaced uh, that variety with a stacked event. So there's no longer BT resistance in South Africa. So 
this is often raised as a, a failure. However, for me, it raises that the risk analysis process works and you can manage risks by uh, introducing various uh, uh, checks and balances. And, and indeed, the, it shows that the uh, monitoring for resistance worked because you saw it and you would do something about it. Uh, South Africa also had challenges on how to regulate stacks. So when the first uh, single events were regulated uh, and then uh, they wanted to breed them, they had to, there were concerns about how they, what data requirements must be uh, put in the application forms. However, you know, over time with the experience, uh, they now have uh, clear guidance in the application forms of what data you need to uh, supply if you have, are applying for a stacked event. Um, glyphosate is a, uh, a topic that, that comes up a lot because uh, some of the, or the herbicide resistant, or herbicide tolerant uh, GM crops are uh, resistant to glyphosate. So there's concerns about increasing glyphosate uh, in, in, in foods. Uh, and so, because there was this concern, the Department of Health uh, did, a, did a survey where they tested the level of herb, uh, herbicides, including glyphosate in foods. And they found that uh, most of the samples they tested, uh, the level of quantification was below the level that they could detect. So it was extremely low levels. Uh, that was for most of the samples. Of the samples that they could test, it was way below the, the maximum residue level. So the exposure level they saw is very low uh, and it was way below the maximum exposure level. And new breeding technique or technologies or techniques are, are highly topical at the moment. Currently, South Africa regulates them as GMOs, although there are still discussion, discussions go, going on about how to regulate SDN1 and SDN2 uh, breeding technologies. So, my point here is that although there have been regulatory challenges, they can be managed using the risk analysis process to manage risk using risk management. So I wanna say something about uh, South Africa's approach. So although we have you know, many different GM crops in South Africa uh, and many different uh, recombinant DNA medicines or medicines produced through GM uh, techniques. These are on the market. However, none of these have originated or been developed uh, within South Africa. So because of this, uh, we, as a, or South, the South African government uh, supports relevant local biotech innovation. Uh, we have a biotech st uh, strategy uh, and we are attempting to ensure that you know, regulatory and market barriers are not excessive because you want your local researchers of which to develop locally relevant products. So I know in South Africa, we've got a very strong biotech uh, researchers and at Kenya has the same thing. You wanna make sure that your researchers will be able to develop locally relevant products to address sustainable development goals uh, and food security. So, we need to ensure that we don't only regulate as if GM tech will always come from outside. We want to develop our own products to address our own uh, uh, challenges. So I just want to end briefly on risk analysis is a tool for decision makers that allows GMOs to con contribute to sustainable development, you know, including food security, including addressing biodiversity issues. Um, the regulatory pathway that GM crops have to go through allows for a highly iterative process to ensure safety during development and post-release. It's not a short process, it's a long process, and there are many steps during that, that process that allows you to ensure safety. So there's a number of mechanisms in place uh, to ensure safety. There's a number of guidance documents to address human health issues such as the Codex Element Elementarius, the International Guidance for Human Health, and uh, the CBD, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety uh, Guidance to look at environmental aspects. So there's a number of different regulatory mechanisms in place. 
and these ensure that we can use GMOs safely and sustainable, sustainably. Uh, and transparency and consultation is integrated into the process and it's an important part of the process. And thank you. Right, thank you so much, uh, James, for shedding light. I think uh, people are getting to learn a lot from you know, the, the deep science and the application of GM technology in South Africa. So we are going to move to the Q&A session, but before we go there, uh, I want to, there's a poll question that was asked at the beginning, uh, two poll questions. We just want to get the results because those are going to also inform the discussion that we'll have before we, tra we transition to the panel discussion where we'll have our panelists coming in. So just the poll results first, and then we get into the Q&A uh, that uh, we have for, yeah. So this is the, the level of knowledge. Most of the people we have, uh, we have not everybody looks, seems like not everybody has done the poll. Uh, I don't know why some people haven't done the poll because these numbers don't talk because we have over 230 people who are logged in. Uh, in this webinar. So it seems like some people actually haven't done the poll. It's important that we, we get your, 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 you know, your, you take the polls because this is part of why we're here. So it looks like uh, most of us here have moderate knowledge about uh, GMOs. Uh, let's see the second poll question because that is what we want to help us uh, set, uh, move into our, our panel discussion. Uh huh. This is uh, this is what is what is the one word that comes to your mind when someone talks about uh, GMOs? Eh? So um, there are many words. Uh, uh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey, do you? There's all these words that we have: is the clones, is fake, is a is a tool, is agribusiness, is uh, contentious. I want I wanted to see which is the word that comes. Uh, you know, which is uh, has more frequency from the poll. Are we able to see that, uh, um, Geoffrey? Because this is general, strange food, uh, improved cancer in our, you know, future yields, risks, future health worries, modified organisms, quality product, unsafe food and cancer, um, you know, food fraud, you know, these are all the words that are coming through from the audience. This is what they take from the from when you hear the word GMO. Because this was since uh, you know the in Kenya since uh, the the ban was lifted. There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of truth and fiction that has been going on. So we wanted to just get uh, yeah, what people think. There's dependence, yes. And so this is also coming through the questions that we. We have uh, we have in the chat and some of the questions that I'm gonna post to 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 our audience. So that's fine. I don't, Geoffrey. We it is good. We we don't have uh, we can't take a what do you say a poll on which is the most common, but we can see what we think. Eh? Many we have many things that we think about when you hear the word GMO. So I'm gonna pick some of the questions that have come through and some that we already had about GMOs which I, we don't have a lot of time, but I hope we can at least answer a few before we transition to the panel discussion, right? So uh, I'll, pull some of the, I'll pose some of the questions to the presenter, starting with the our first presentation, which is uh, from Dr. Catherine, uh, talking about what are the challenges uh, that are uh, you know, facing us? Uh, you, know, you address the issue, the, 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 the topic, what are the challenges that are addressing, are facing or causing us to be food insecure that are challenging our food production and food systems, right? So from all these challenges that you, you post for you as the researcher at Calro, I want to you to, from this question that we have, for you, what is the most pressing challenge from the many that you, 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 you highlighted? What is the most pressing challenge that you see if we face it, because you talked about many things, you talked about uh, climate change, the, the issue of drought, which in Kenya is a reality. We can see people actually dying because uh, of uh, 
perspective, Dr. Catherine, what do you think is that problem? If it is addressed, then we could actually address uh, food and nutrition security in sustainable food systems. So in two minutes, please just respond to that because you highlight many challenges, but we want to, you to focus for us that challenge that you think we need to address us up so that we can have uh, food and nutrition security. Over to you, Dr. Catherine. You're muted, you're muted. Sorry, thank you, Jay. I think the most prominent uh, challenge is climate change. Climate change um, entails environmental conditions and you know, uh, without the optimal environmental conditions, we can have no production whatsoever uh, in agriculture. Look at the drought we've been having. I hate the, 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 uh, the, the most strongest drought we've had in the past 40 years. And, and um, I even have a, coll a, a colleague whose sheep have been dying in Kajadu because there's just been no rain uh, from the beginning of the year. So if we can address climate change, I think that's the most um, prominent challenge I can see in terms of agricultural food production. And so in addressing climate change, how, how is it, what is it that we need to address? Uh, we are, we how are we going to address climate change? Okay, there are things we are doing like um, in industries, we have to look for alternative, uh, fossil fuel is one of the biggest um, contributors to climate change. If we can reduce our use of fossil fuel, yeah? If we can give our cattle fodder that's not that's going to help them in the enteric fermentation, that they're not going to emit a lot of carbon dioxide and methane, things like that. Reducing the carbon footprint will help towards addressing climate change. And so as a, a biotech expert yourself, how, uh, how are we gonna address, use the tools, GM tools to address climate change? Cause that is now the, our pressing problem. Do you think okay. Genetic modification or GMO is going to address our most pressing challenge now, which is climate change. Okay, let me go back to um, uh, cattle, and they produce a lot of methane. We have been able in Cairo to come up with a probiotic, which is able to utilize even very poor, uh, very poor quality fodder, and there's uh, the re re the emission of of uh, carbon dioxide is actually reduced by thirty percent. If you use that probiotic, mix it with a, your fodder and give it to your cows. So that's another way of trying to reduce the um, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Okay, so I'll get back to you at, at another stage. So okay. I, I get back, I, I get uh, to- Catherine, uh, I could also <laughs> add to what Catherine is saying. Could I compliment Catherine? Mm -hmm. Could I compliment Yeah, that's Catherine fine, that I was coming question. to you. I was coming to you, Dr. Wambugu. So let me just, if you want to compliment Catherine, let me ask you the question I was going to ask Catherine as a follow-up question. So yes, so you, she talked about cattle because in fact, one of the things that is right now, we realize that climate change is is, is real. And, and, and people, uh, you know, people actually die because uh, there's no water, there's no, uh, they can't produce food and because there is no water. So what is, is it that we should, if as we shift to, you know, introducing GM, whether it is the seed, the grain, or that I'll ask later, in, should we be addressing, you know, the water challenge or should we be addressing the breed or species or variety challenge? Because even if we had the variety, Dr. Wabogo, the best of them all without water, are we going to produce food to feed ourselves? Yeah, again, I think there are a number of things we could do, as I agree, there's no panacea this, it's just looking for ways to reduce the impact of climate change. We are really not saying we can uh, completely eliminate the challenge of climate change. What we can do is um, reduce the impact or manage the impact. And the one way uh, GM technology have been proven to reduce the impact of climate change is by varieties. We have got even the work that is being done here in Kenya uh, by Carlo and the ATF, there are varieties that are more, need less water. There's more tolerance, water tolerance. Some are traditional breeding, but also enhanced with some GM ability to actually produce still more with less water. Remember the Katumani maize that is famous. 
that very, very, very principle. We only look at money maze, which within a very short, either by escaping drought uh, or, or maturing array. So that has also been enhanced using GM technology, whereas you need less water. The second one, also in rice, in many, many crops, there's a lot of research to use less water, but have an agreeable yield, a bit of a compromise, because you cannot have zero water. Some water, but also have an acceptable yield. The second one, have been used greatly in the developed countries, something called no-till, meaning you don't go with a tractor turn off the land. You actually produce without a lot of uh, uh, interfering with the soil. And there are two big benefits there. One of it is you, you use the water that was from previous season. You are kind of a no-till, you, you, you plant without using the previous water, you are kind of managing the water. You, the plant starts kick-starting by the water that was there. Of course, the, the winter there keeps a lot of water in the soil. And the second one, because you don't turn off the soil, you do not release CO2, oxygen, you, you don't release the carbon that affects the environment. So you're actually managing the CO2 and you're also managing the water. Um, the other one, the third one, which is really very, very useful, is producing less within a small piece of land. Uh, that means if you have a height in variety, and uh, let's say uh, you are able to manage it at the project because the GM technology comes as a package, meaning uh, once you use it, you're also going to manage that a little have more of, of this and that and that. You're going to get more from a, a unit piece of land. And that also has been seen to be very helpful because uh, even with a small unit of land, you can have more and reduce what you are, you are calling, uh, well, we don't do that a lot of here in Kenya, but a lot of countries, they call it crash and burn. You continue to expand the area. Let's say you're going to produce one ton of maize. You can produce it within a, a small area, which is manageable. Or if you have less tonnage, then you go on spreading more land. So you're using less land for the same amount of, of production. And that itself has impact on the environment, impact on the bottom line, impact on the people. And, and so okay. these are the okay. areas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ambugo, for shedding some light. So I'll take you back to th that same question of say uh, why we want to use improved seed, which is a good thing. But one of the questions I've seen in the chat is that as we introduce the you know the the improved seed, the GM seed, eh, we risk losing our own because I know where I come from they actually don't use improved seed. They use land races, farmer saved seed. And actually my mom cannot tell you that those seeds, in fact, when she grows them, she sometimes they don't even use any fertilizer. They don't use uh, any pesticides. It's gonna yield. So she grows, my mom has both a small place where she grows the, you know, her own seed from before, the farm, what we call the farmer saved seed. Then she also uses the hybrid. So when the hybrid, which is more on large scale, she needs the, the whole package, the fertilizer, the pesticides she's going to use. So the challenge here is, if we actually are talking about what people like to call food sovereignty, the fact that we may actually introduce the seed and then we, might, we need the package, like you said, that goes with the improved seed, as opposed to if I'm using my own seed, some of these varieties, where they see vegetables, maize, beans, they are adapted to local conditions and they can yield something. Even if the rains failed totally, you'll get something as opposed to the hybrid seed or the improved seed. What is your take? Because that is the fear some people have that, yes, the improved seeds are good. They're going to give you this good yields, but it comes as a package. While on the other hand, the uh, local seed or the farmer seed, seed, you could get something even without external input, even under conditions of drought. That is some a concern I have seen in the charts and before people is ex expressing that we, we risk this game go, becoming dependent on the seed that needs external input, while we lose the seed that may do, may give us some yield, however little, even without external inputs. Dr. Wambuku. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree is a concern, and I'm sure all, all, all farmers are that concerned, nobody wants to lose their seed. 
And uh, first and foremost, I would believe completely nobody will force you you lose your seed. Nobody will tell you plant this by force. There will be no government donated law saying, um, oh, if they are donated, they'll be challenged in court and they'll be dropped because it makes no sense. Uh, people have to uh, be allowed to, to, to grow their food the way they have always grown. Remember, we also have the organic choice. So me, I look at this gene from a former, former political view that we have, we are growing population. Not everybody can grow their own food. People are growing, population is growing beyond what the country can produce. People are moving to urban areas. Look at the situation right now. We do not have in our maize. We are importing something we should be growing. We are importing, why are we importing? Because of course you can say there's drought, but even that, our own production have been limited by ability to invest. Agriculture is an investment business. Forget, yes, there's my own area, I can grow my own, and I do grow my own in my small garden, but that cannot feed the large population of Kenya. Kenya needs a mechanized, uh, supported system to produce maize in a way that you feed the population. And that's why we are actually importing. That's why we are buying from outside. Because we have to invest in all those things that we are saying. And look, we have always used the hybrid seed and not forced anybody to, even now as we are, there are people who use hybrid seed. The large plantations in the Kitale are doing that so that you can feed the nation. That is feeding myself, but there is feeding the nation. There are many people in urban areas who are not growing their own seed or growing their own maize. They depend on going to a, a shop and the finding flour there. So if we, we use the same law, everybody has to grow their own maize, we are not gonna feed a nation. A nation must be fed by a continuous improved seed, breeding investment in the system I talked about, the water, the fertilizer, the mechanization, so we can feed the bigger population. And all this should coexist together. They should all be able to coexist and, and be able to manage. It. And that's why the issue of, uh, uh, of coexistence is very, very important. So I see it that way. Mm. So um, just uh, as I get back to, to James, uh, it is interesting in your presentation that uh, when you projected the, the Africa map, Africa, we have like 55 countries, they're about. And uh, it's only in three countries where, you know, GM is actually, uh, you know, is legalized, you know, is uh, people are producing and consuming. Uh, I'm just wondering what is it? I mean, don't, because we have just lifted the ban. What do you think is holding back? Is it, do you think, do you, in your own perspective, Dr. Ambubu, these people do not know that the, the science that we, we're talking about, why is it that, there's that fear. I mean, it is, I was surprised that it's only those few countries where, you know, there's a, you know, this uh, GGM uh, food is actually there, uh, you know, being produced and consumed. So what is the fear? Or should we be Kenyans, as we introduce GMO, should we have, is there something we should fear that other countries uh, are running away, including our neighbors, Uganda, Tanzania, they have actually reinforced their stand on GM food. Jane, if you look at the first table, how many countries in Africa are there who have got their researchers and their bottle are working with the trials? Forget the other table. Forget the first table where there were so many countries. Start there, Jane, then you come to the other one. There were so many countries. Myself, I written a book about biotechnology in Africa. And I was surprised about 34, uh, I, uh, about 34 contributions from African scientists in their bottle. All are trying to do, are trying to produce crops. Do you know what limited them? Biosafety. The cost of biosafety been very, very high. And you had my colleague from South Africa explaining the system that are needed to be put in place. The regulatory, because it was politicized. You no longer have a science based where you are saying, are the food is safe or not safe? Now we're asking, there's so much politics. And that's why you see the countries which did not politicize, like America did not politicize the technology. They have gone ahead, or Argentina, or where. Even South Africa would be doing better than they are doing. When you politicize a technology, you make it as, as regulated by politicians in the parliament. And then after five years, that group goes, another one comes. These are the results. That is one. So I see the political regulation. The countries which are not politicized the regulation are going ahead. The second one, I see the cost of regulatory. But I see many, many scientists in African labs that have been struggling to get into this. And if you look at that one, it really shows that almost every country, it has tried and tried. Then you, you hit a political milestone. 
Uh, and, and so I see it that way. And of course, then the trouble is also, you need the money to publicize. This webinar, someone must sponsor it for you to take the word out. You can't just go there talking. Someone has to cost to, 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 to finance communication. Even universities, they very much want to go out and they communicate, but it costs. So if they, if they support to fight the communication by our system, people will debate, like you see in South Africa, they, there's a, they fight the, like, the discussions and the dialogue, and that allows the public to debate. We were not told because the public can be allowed to debate, they have not allowed anything out. It's a consultative, it's engaging, it's transparent, but they have moved ahead because the, the government fights also public dialogue, communication and engagement. So we need Kenya to do the same, you gotta do the same. Don't just fight the technology, also fund the communication and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambubo. In fact, it's good you brought that. We'll discuss a little bit more about that bit of communication and funding the communication. We'll talk about it more in the, in the plenary because again, it's about who funds that research or the communication. Because I, uh, let me dispel the, the fact that this particular webinar is not sponsored by anyone. It's actually being hosted by the University of Nairobi, organized by KWAD. Nobody has sponsored it because we want to raise awareness. But there's a dark question of he who pays the piper calls the tune. He finds the research, we find the communication. They may actually want you to tailor that message in a certain way. So we'll come back to that in the plenary discussion. But it's important to know that there is money involved. If you're going to raise awareness, if you're going to, uh, you know, you know, communicate about this, because many people actually they this fear, real fear about this GMOs until. Uh, somebody gives us facts, then that fear is going to continue. That's why I'm going to come to James. Uh, you know, I don't know in South Africa how you have done this. Who, because clearly in South Africa, the GM, you had Professor Hutchinson say that she has consumed that GM. She doesn't know. I mean, she knows or she doesn't know. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this, the need to, to raise awareness to, educate the public about GM and you know regulate to ensure because we have we have real fears you know so how has South Africa approached that you know to ensure that you dispel the fear uh, you know dispel the myths there are a lot, of, a lot of myths and fiction about GM how has South Africa addressed this to the point that it is I mean the GM food is found commonly produced and consumed um, I think some of that has to do with how early we adopted the technology when the government realized it was safe uh, to eat and grow and it was accepted. There wasn't this politicized or political political like debate going on that that uh, Dr. Wambungu raised. And so when we adopted it, people then saw that this this is, just normal maize that has insect resistant, uh, tastes the same, it looks the same. Uh, we can carry on growing our conventional varieties or our land races. You know, uh, a lot of what I'm seeing going on in the chat, chat here is uh, making the case for something which is, I think is a false dichotomy. You know, it's not an either or situation. You know, you can have your local land races and grow GM crops. Uh, so, the way that it was integrated into our system, the farmers, including small scale farmers, saw the benefits from it and adopted it. And, and that's not to say that they don't still gross land races. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, a lot of this, the chat going on um, in, the, in the, the webinar chat, it's yeah, creating this false opposition of agroecology against GMOs. Uh, you know, obviously, agroecology is a value-based system, so they don't want GMOs. But that's not to say that you can't use uh, GMOs and agroecological systems. A lot of the small-scale farmers use it uh, uh, in, you know, agroecological approaches with their GMOs. You know, the no-tool strategies that are allowed with the herbicide tolerance varieties, uh, the insect resistance, you know, and using push-pull systems with the insect resistance. You know, so I think it's two main things. And 
one, the early adoption, you know, where there wasn't this political debate going on, uh, and two, the farmers, including small scale farmers, see the benefits from it and have been using this technology. Um, I, I do think that one of the things that that will drive the acceptance of GMOs is when we see benefits that are not just for the farmers. Um, because especially when you think about uh, GM medicines, you know, obviously there's a very clear benefit for the person taking it. You know, the, 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 the uh, anti-cancer drugs, the monoclonal antibodies, the interferons, which, which help to, to get rid of cancer in the body. You know, nobody's saying I'm not gonna take it because GM. The, the insulin that you have access to for somebody who's diabetic in Kenya, it's produced through GM technology. Nobody's saying I'm not going to take it because it's GM, but that's because there's a clear benefit for the, the consumer. Uh, when the traits come start coming through that are benefiting consumers more, I think we'll see a, that consumers are more likely to, to uh, accept GM crops. And which is one of the reasons why, you know, in my I think it was my last slide, I showed that we want local researchers to develop traits and, and crops and varieties that address local needs. Because once that happens, uh, it's, you're gonna get higher uh, consumer acceptance. So um, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, so that brings me to the, to the, the, the there's a question about this scale of production. I think in South Africa, most, I, I don't know what is the average uh, farmer, what do you call a small scale or a large scale uh, in South Africa? I believe the large scale, it's very easy, you know, because of the, you know, ensuring that you do not, the, the small holders are protected. So in the large scale farms, they can actually ensure that, you know, there's a, the, the borders that are allowed to avoid the, you know, movement of, 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 of poll, I mean, pollen across, right? But if, what is, I, I'm wondering, what is the average size when you talk about a small scale farmer in South Africa, what does that look like? And what is a large scale farmer like? Um, so it depends on what crop you're talking about. Uh, uh, okay. And, and it's very- But on average. Because, <laughs> I think so- No, because in Kenya, talk, when you talk about small scale, we are talking about less than two acres. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so I would South say Africa, between two and, five, like? two and five acres. Uh, Okay. And, and again, it depends. And, and, and often you find that there's a, a combined approach. So the same farmer will grow both GM and like GM maize and local land races. You know, it's not, as I said, it's not an either or approach. So, so small scale farmers growing GM are not necessarily only going to go GM. GM. And maybe that they, they alternate between seasons, you know, based on the availability of seed and what they have. So, yeah. Yeah, so for us, I think the fear would be, you know, protecting that small scale farmer who does not want to grow GM. How do they do that? I mean, they still have access to their, to their traditional land races. Uh, yeah, uh, but if my neighbor is growing GM, how do I ensure that I'm protected? So, that, that is an issue if you are specifically growing organic or, or you yes. want to be uh, agri, like certified agroecology. Uh, and then, then there are ways you can manage it. You make sure that you don't you know, have neighbors that plant GM or you plant, you, depending on the crop, again, it's, it's different depending on the crop, but uh, you can uh, stagger it so that they don't uh, pollinate or at all. Uh, the pollen production doesn't occur at the same time. So there, there are, and things like maize, maize pollen doesn't flow very far. So you don't have to have very far distances. So uh, different areas have different approaches to this. Some it's more regulated than others. Some it's, you know, speak to your neighbor. <laughs> if he's growing GM, you, yes, you make sure. Okay, you, so. Yes, I get that. I get that, James, because that, that is a challenge that people have raised. Eh? There are people actually, there are some smallholder farmers in Kenya who are actually producing for niche markets. Okay. They are producing 
for niche market either in Europe or even in high end, uh, you know, yeah. uh, markets in Kenya. And they want, they do not want any interaction with GM, you know. And so when you, what you're saying that uh, that uh, gentleman's agreement that you talk to your neighbor that you, hey, I'm producing GM, I do not have any control over my neighbor. Yeah. And like, so, hey, you know, so where does my protection come from? So, so two things that like uh, generally, if, if people are producing for a niche market, even if it's organic, often they're using hybrid seeds anyway. So they're not collecting and planting seeds the next year. Obviously, the case in Kenya might be different. Uh, I don't know what goes on there. So every year, you know, even if you do get cross-pollination with your neighbor, you're not collecting seeds. So you're, you're, you're not going to be planting GM seeds by accident. Uh, so that's the one way you can manage it. The other way you can manage it, if there is a low level of, cross-pollination, even if your neighbors right next door to you, more than 90% of GM maize pollen falls within the first two meters of the plant. So even if there is some cross-pollination, there might be one or two seeds that, that would be uh, 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 considered GM amongst the many millions of seeds. Uh, uh, so okay. There are ways to manage it with distance. You make that distance a little bit bigger, there will be zero seed that, that, is, that is GM. Thank you. Thank you. I think with this discussion can go on. for. I want us to transition to the panel discussion. And uh, while we do, I don't know, uh, Geoffrey, you need to have put in the poll question, uh, the Jean, second poll question. Is it? To, Jean, to, to, yes. Yeah. Jean, I yes. Exit. Please, I'm going to another meeting. So please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambogu. I think we'll continue okay. this discussion. It is yes. just starting. So we'll continue the yes. discussion. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank all right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, the poll, the second poll question should be already there. But in the as that question is going on, I uh, think please let us answer because that uh, the, the 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 link will help us to the your responses will help us in the next session, which is the panel discussion where we are going to have a brief remarks, three minutes remarks from our panelists uh, who, just a minute, sorry, who I want to just uh, introduce as they start to give their presentations. Um, we have, uh, sorry. So please put put the poll question, Geoffrey, so that uh, people can be taking that poll as we start this uh, the second session, the poll, uh, the the panel discussion. We have uh, these are our panelists. Uh, let me just go to uh, to our panelists, uh, starting from Dr. Mary Mwale, and then we have uh, the second panelist, uh, Dr. Roy. Mm -hmm. Mugira. Then we have Noah Nasieli, we have Dr. Andre uh, uh, Edewa, and then Professor Miano and Ms. Lydia Kimani. So we start with the, so each of these panel panelists have a question to answer about their perspective about GMO and their role in addressing food and nutrition security in sustainable food system. So we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Mary uh, Mwale from, uh, who is uh, our, our our panelists coming to us from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. She's the head of food security. So Mary, please, if you may, take your three minutes to tell us about your perspective on the role of GMOs uh, in the addressing food and nutrition security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, good. Hey, hey. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dr. Mary Mwale. I'll, uh, I'll use, I'm using my phone. So uh, I'm a food and nutrition security specialist at the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development. I'm deployed as a head of food security unit. So first of all, I thank the organizers for bringing this, uh, uh, to bring experts together to clarify on issues on GM foods, to make Kenyans understand why this policy direction was made. We analyze agriculture food systems and national food policy implementation programs with regards to food systems and national uh, food availability, accessibility, early warning signals on food production, 
stocks, marketing, prices, quality, uh, implement, importations, research and capacity at all levels. This mainly to inform decision making towards realization of the national food and nutrition security. So this subject is important because the right to food is a component of the human rights recognized under international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights and is legally binding on all ratifying member states. The international treaty provisions have been domesticated through constitutional and legislative incorporation uh, through which the government supports progressive realization of the right to adequate food for national security. This therefore implies ensuring that the quality of food is available in sufficient quantity to satisfy the dietary needs of individuals, free from adverse substances, acceptable within a given culture and accessible in ways that are sustainable. Under international law, states have the obligation to protect individuals' cultural means to access their food in adequate amounts and quality and pro proactively engage in activities intended to strengthen people's access and utilization of resources to meet their food needs, be they farmers, pastoralists, hunters, or gatherers, or simply as buyers. The government has therefore continuously formulated cross-sectoral policies and strategies combined with legislation pertaining to various dimensions of the right to food, which are addressed concurrently through laid down principles and obligations of competent authorities. We recognize that responsible investment in sustainable agriculture and food system is essential for enhancing food security and nutrition, and is therefore, uh, and therefore in supporting progressive realization of the right to food. Uh, Kenya has had three main policies since 1991. The first policy focused on uh, maintaining broad food self-sufficiency, just having food. And then the second uh, policy of 1994 focus on market-driven uh, approach. However, this did not work well to uh, ensure food security. So the, past, the third policy, which uh, was uh, enacted in 2012, uh, focused on, uh, adopted a multi-sectoral approach on food security because it was not just about production and marketing, but there's more to, ensure, to attaining food security. So this was mainly following the intense uh, drought, severe droughts, recurrent uh, population uh, increase and uh, declining production. So it encompassed multi-level food systems framework approach to ensure that there's holistic coverage of foods, all the food security dimensions. Ultimately, this policy action should have culminated to national food security, entailing safe, adequate, acceptable food, affordable, and, at, uh, and affordable at all times to satisfy nutritional needs of all persons, as well as protecting vulnerable populations using cost-effective you know, uh, uh, effect, uh, cost measures. So the food and food security has emphasized also partnerships where it engages all value chain actors uh, to deliver food uh, along the value chain from farm to fork uh, in a sustainable environment. So we have established policy frameworks, standards, regulations, and uh, market protocols. A national food system transformation pathway encompasses all aspects of food insecurity, ranging from economic, social, and environmental drivers, and values incentivizing all actors along the value chain, acting synergistically in a conducive policy environment to fulfill our nutrition requirements sustainably, and guaranteeing that opportunities for food security and nutrition for future generations are not compromised. However, despite all these efforts, okay. So oh, you, your three minutes are over. So you, okay, let, what just is allow the time? me to finish. Thank you. The, despite this, all these efforts, our food production has stagnated below our consumption needs. Uh, population needs are higher than what we are able to produce. We are importing more, uh, most of our staples, maize, wheat, and rice, uh, which have not increased in tandem, in, tandem, in tandem with population growth. So we, our import options are also limited because we have a preference for non-GM foods. So we suffered the highest food deficit in 2022 following intensifying severe drought and trailing effects of COVID-19 uh, lockdowns, ravaging effects of the new pests and diseases for Lamy, Wamstem, Boras, and MNLD, and the global effect of sanctions related to Russian Ukrainian war. The cost of production has also increased, namely fertilizer, seeds, fertilizers, and the like. So food prices have also increased while poverty has deepened, affecting purchasing power. And our reliance on imports does not augur well with sovereign food sovereignty. We pay a premium price for pure non-GM foods, mainly maize and soya. 
Currently, the national made food balance sheet is indicating that we do not have enough food and we're likely to run out of uh, adequate stocks by April next year. So we are in the same situation we have been in this, this year. So some exporters, have, uh, exporters from other countries have also rationed food to our, towards our country. So the ministry analyzed this situation and availed scientific, uh, available scientific evidence and requested the cabinet to lift the ban and approve importation of GMAs for consumption and in the long run allow cultivation of GMAs. This follows completion of safety assessment conducted by the, our competent authorities. The recent uh, performance trials have proved no uh, adverse effects on humans and uh, we can uh, get the uh, health benefits, economic and social benefits from tapping on the risk, this scientific evidence. So we can capitalize on the traits that uh, help us to resist diseases, to improve farmers' income, improve nutrition, and also uh, ensure that uh, our, pro our uh, environment is sustainable. So just a parting note is that the Teosinti plant, which was the maize corn uh, 10,000 years ago, is now the current big plant of corn, and it has not had any adverse effects, and all of us are consuming it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mary. Thank you so much, yes. Mary. I think uh, I want us to actually keep it brief and to the point so that we have more, we'll have more discussion after this. So Dr. Andrew Edewa, please in three minutes, just uh, uh, highlight your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, from a food safety perspective, um, I, I do recognize that the uh, food safety by definition is uh, assuring consumers that uh, the food that they eat does not carry with it um, the potential risk or uh, to cause adverse health effects. This means that uh, uh, any hazards in the food must be uh, mitigated to the point that uh, uh, we are able to consume the food and live for as many years as possible. And even if we die, it's not as a result of uh, unsafe food. Uh, we do recognize that GM uh, technologies lead to less use of pesticides and, um, and these synthetic uh, fertilizers, which are the sources of chemicals linked to unsafe food. Um, by having GM foods, uh, we do therefore expect a reduced um, exposure to um, cancer or, or those chronic cases that may lead to cancer as a result of um, uh, pesticides or uh, other synthetic chemicals. Um, in the processing, we do also recognize that the industry has the opportunity through GM to uh, fortify food and uh, enhance its quality. And this is a great benefit which we see in terms of also improving the quality of the food itself. And in, in trade, we do recognize that it's important to assure the consumers further that what they are eating is safe and that if there are any significant differences with conventionally produced food, that they are aware and that they can make informed choices. In this regard, two, two key concerns arise. One is the possibility of toxicity of foods derived from this recombinant DNA. Uh, we need to assure the consumers that uh, this possibility is uh, mitigated. And also the second one is the possibility of allergenicity or the proteins that may arise from the foods derived from uh, this recombinant DNA or any modifications of the DNA itself. In this regard, therefore, uh, from a food safety perspective um, and from the studies carried out so far and uh, across uh, the world by WHO, FAO, and uh, the framework of Codex, and by other agencies responsible for GM technologies directly, they have shown no evidence at all of uh, any adverse health effects to, um, uh, I mean, in terms of consuming GM foods as compared to conventional foods, which means that uh, if you compare, if you analyze two uh, foods, GM foods and the conventional foods, that uh, the end result is that uh, there is no significant difference at all in terms of the adverse health effects. However, I also have to point out that uh, due to the need to facilitate trade in the region and globally, it's important that GM foods be clearly labeled to make consumers make an informed choice 
and to allow governments who still have not given the policy and regulatory frameworks to uh, be able to trade the food, which is non-GM, but to allow those who have got this opportunity to trade without any problem at all. Let us not use GM as a reason to uh, inhibit trade, but rather to facilitate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adele, for keeping it uh, the three minutes. So we'll have the discussion after that. So Professor Miano, please, uh, in your three minutes, your perspective, please. So no, no need to introduce yourself because the, 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 you know, the slide is giving your interest. So just in your three minutes kindly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ambuko. I hope I can be heard clearly. Yes, we can hear you, thank you. All right, thank you. So I, I think um, the question that has been posed is uh, our perspective on the law of GMOs in, in an effort to address challenges on productivity and food and nutritional security. And one thing that I would want to first of all bring up is that uh, we should not be generalizing and talking about GMOs, GMOs like everything is being changed to a GMO. And one of the uh, principles that we use is that each crop that has been um, modified or improved using genetic modification, there is a specific trait or a specific issue that is being addressed. So then we should not necessarily generalize everything and saying that uh, is a GM technology going to solve our problems. One of the things that we should use is to be uh, specific on which case are we dealing with? Because if, for example, we are using the technology to improve. You can get Sorry? Yes, go on. I don't know what's talking. Yes. All right. So what I was saying is that um, if, for example, uh, a particular crop has been uh, uh, in, um, enhanced for the um, for nutritional value, then you assess that crop on that basis. If you come and look at uh, a crop that has been um, enhanced for protection against pests or diseases, then you look at it from that particular perspective and look at it and say that if, for example, maize is improved for um, for tolerance to, to drought or has been improved for insect resistance. So you look at it and say that because of that trait that has been added, how is that going to improve on the issues of food security or productivity in terms of the, the specificity of the trait? So we should not necessarily be generalizing and talking about uh, like GMO is a, a system of production, which is not the case. It's not a system of production. It's a, a technology that is being used to enhance production in a particular uh, a specific trait. So that being the case, um, my point is that uh, the use of the technology will help in solving the particular issue that we want to address. And in that way, yes, it is helping to improve productivity and it's helping in improving the nutritional value of that particular food or that particular crop. So we should not be generalizing, let's be specific, and uh, let's look at what we want to address and how the genetic engineering technology is helping us to achieve the goal that we are looking for. And for that particular reason, it is helping us, just like we have been doing breeding for, for particular traits of interest. So the next point I would want to bring across is that, um, I have heard people talking about the source of farding. And um, I would want to see a scientist who is farding his or her own research. Because uh, let's truth be told, we are all looking for funds. I am a researcher, I am a scientist, and I keep writing proposals and writing, uh, uh, looking for funds from the government, from the donors and from everybody else. So somebody's talking about uh, who, who pays uh, the paper calls the tune, I would want to see that scientist who is really working on his uh, research and saying that he's paying for his money or he's selling his lad or whatever he's taking his businesses. Majority of us are looking for funds from wherever I can be able to get it. And uh, it doesn't mean that because I'm necessarily working on uh, genetically modified uh, as a technology, I'm being paid for that. I could have still have gone to another technology, but I have looked at the issues that needs to be addressed and how that issue can be addressed and seeing this is the best technology that can be used. So 
um, I wanted to answer that question of where the funds are coming from, because I would want to see even the NGOs that are uh, having a different opinion, the majority of them are also being funded from a particular source. So the, the other point that I would want to bring across is that um, one of the advantages that we have on this technology is that we have a clear system of safety regulations. So, and it is all over the world. It is uh, started by the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the international body that looks at the issues of uh, um, conservation of, of biodiversity, looks at how that we can be able to utilize biodiversity in a sustainable way, and while at the same time saying that uh, we are able to share the benefits that can come out of the, uh, the genetic resources that we have. So in terms of safety, both as food, as feed, and to the environment is actually covered and looked at in a very comprehensive way than maybe any other of the other technologies that we are talking about in terms of food production. So okay. in my perspective, the role of GMOs in, uh, in, in our efforts to make sure that we address the food challenges, either on productivity or on nutritional security, it is there and it is going to contribute and help us, but we must look at it on a case by case. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Miano. I will uh, quickly go to uh, Dr. Roy Mugira from NBA. Uh, again, we'll have that discussion, but then just uh, Dr. Roy, if you may, in three minutes, with your perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jane, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this particular discussion. I am a regulator and therefore I am the person who is between the product developers that have just spoken and also the concerns that have been expressed by the rest of the team. I want to appreciate the definition that was given by Professor Margaret Hutchinson in our opening remarks that she put it very plain that all of us now are able to understand uh, what particularly are we talking about uh, GM technology or GMO, what is it? So that we have a common understanding of what that is. I also like to ride on the presentation that has been made by uh, our counterpart in South Africa, uh, Dr. James Rhodes uh, from the regulator in South Africa and ECHO, the kind of uh, regulatory framework that is in South Africa is uh, a replica of what we practice here because both Kenya and South Africa as signatories and state parties to the Katayana Protocol on Biosafety that uh, came into being to regulate this space. Uh, James explained why uh, this technology is regulated, and this stems from the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Katayana Protocol on Biosafety, and the national regulatory systems. For Kenya, for example, we have the National Biosafety Biotechnology Development Policy of 2006, the Biosafety Act of 2009, and the establishment of the NBA in 2010. Now, then we published the regulations in 2011 and 2012. What is the mandate of NBA basically is to ensure and assure the safety of GMOs uh, for human and animal health and to provide an adequate protection of the environment. I want to uh, agree with uh, what has been expressed by Dr. Edewa um, in uh, respect to the concerns. What are the concerns that are coming through? Aspects of allergenicity and uh, toxicity and uh, the assurance that he is asking for, and that is why we are established. So what we do when we are assessing the safety of any particular GM technology, like Professor Miano has explained, we look at food and feed safety. So we check on substantial equivalence to see whether uh, this um, new crop is substantially equivalent to the non-transformed one. We also check for allergenicity. There is a method to do that uh, by aligning the, 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 um, the sequence of the protein, the new protein with existing and known allergenic, allergenic uh, causing uh, compounds. We also do the same for toxicity and we also conduct uh, animal feeding tests. Uh, with the next thing that we check is environmental safety, where we look at weedness. Is this crop, does it have the potential to become a super weed? I mean, a plant that cannot be controlled. 
Is there potential for gene flow for, for pollen uh, through pollination to have genes flow to uh, wild relatives? Is there effect on non-target organisms? And finally, we conduct a socioeconomic an analysis. Uh, I, will, uh, I have seen the kind of uh, questions and comments that are coming on the chat. One, one interesting one was asking, if I take a BT maize, will, I, will that transform me into an insect? I mean, all these concerns are legitimate uh, because they are stemming from either uh, not having sufficient information or having the, not the right information. But uh, our role, I want to emphasize this, is to ensure and assure. So the point that has been raised by Dr. Edawa uh, is, is quite valid. He needs to ensure uh, that safety. So uh, I do, want, do not want to go further than this, uh, Madam Facilitator. I want to donate uh, the minutes that I've been able to share so that other Thank colleagues you. can say a few more things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You just cleared your minutes. You didn't donate. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mugira. So let's have uh, uh, let's have uh, no Mr. Nona Sieli, our the most important man in the house, the farmer. Can you give us your brief perspective about uh, uh, you know GM and the, the and, and food security. I think as a farmer from a farmer or a farmer group leader's perspective. Thank you, three minutes. Thank you very much. I kindly confirm if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here among some of the most learned. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mugira for your insights. I have seen your interviews, really excited to to, to keep on learning. So I stand here as a farmer representing farmers, working with close to 580,000 uh, smallholder farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa, myself being uh, a farmer as well. And uh, recently I received, uh, and, and I, I got a new role as the brand ambassador for Alliance for Science, where it is basically a communication uh, organization trying to demystify some of the facts and some of the myths that are out there. Standing here uh, with my 15 years experience as a farmer, I'll just talk briefly, probably a minute about my failed crops, my not able to go to the market, but most importantly, it is the, the myths that have surrounded uh, what GMO is all about. I have been asked uh, a, few, a few days back whether I am for or against GMO. I can tell you for sure that I am for. And one of the reasons is because as a smallholder farmer, I invest, and just the same as most smallholder farmers, we invest so that we can be able to get the best yields using the least uh, resources, uh, that, that the, the, the least resources that we have, but also uh, lower cost of production. I have I started growing from the OPVs, what we call open field uh, varieties, and uh, migrated slowly, uh, not very willingly, into hybrids because of very obvious reasons, expensive seeds and all that. But that was part of it. What happens to GMO, I think, uh, from a smallholder farmer, as, uh, but a moderator, as you can put it, is that what we are looking for, we as farmers, we want to produce. We want to help feed the world. But we also want to know what is the truth and not bias. Dr. Florence has actually uh, said it clearly that we want to be able to get more from the same pieces of land. But what is the confusion that is surrounding GMO and the discussion around GMO. Number one, some of this discussion has been done in boardrooms. Some of this discussion has been done in conferences, but very little of this information has been disseminated into language that smallholder farmers can understand. Remember, the smallholder farmers are the ones who are actually buying these seeds. They're the ones who are growing these crops. But again, it was very clear from Madam Florence's uh, perspective. So, is, is that it is not just about the seed, it's about soil health and all that. And where I stand also is that I, I am a soil health ambassador, Africa soil health ambassador. And what my role is, is basically me and my organization called A Farmers is basically to make sure that farmers understand their soils. So you can imagine if farmers have good soils, if farmers have affordable uh, other inputs, and then they get proper seeds that can yield better for commercial purposes, Definitely will not be hearing this thing about drought because farmers will be able to produce. So my appeal is number one, 
let every good relationship, every good relationship for those who are in relationships now is based on good communication. So I'll repeat that again. Every good relationship is based on good communication. We as farmers, you as scientists and other stakeholders, if we can be able to partner together so that we can be able to bring this information that is coming from the labs, from the research and from other stakeholders into a language and a platform where farmers can be able to understand, then definitely farmers will be able to take it up. Again, let us continue working together. We have so much to talk about. I have been here, I got lost a bit. I had to take some screenshots of what was being discussed, but that is what smallholder farmers are going through. I can understand because of other things. What about the smallholder farmers? So my appeal, and it is very interesting to see Dr. Mugira here, the research that has been done, what the president has come out and said, yes, we are going to lift the ban and we're going to make this a reality. Let us not just attack GMO. Let us not just say, okay, yes, let, it has been passed, let's go on. Let us disseminate it. Let us go even into the counties because agriculture has been devolved. devolved. Let us see how we can be able to retrain this extension of research so that they can be able to guide farmers. Again, Thank you. representing... A a farmers, uh, we are ready as a farmers media. We, I also run a media channel that we are ready to help support the dissemination of this reliable, accurate, and unbiased information for smallholder farmers to be able to produce more. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Noah, for that uh, very um, precise comment message to us, the scientists. So let's briefly hear from Lydia. Give us your three minutes, then we go to some little discussion. I know we are really behind schedule, but we will, we will we'll, we'll manage. Lydia, please, if you're there. Don't introduce yourself, just give your perspective and then, uh, yeah. Lydia, are you there? Lydia is not in the, in the can anybody, a panelist, can you see Lydia? I can't see because I'm using, I'm um, sharing my screen. Can we see Lydia? Is she there? If she's not, then... I can't see her as one of the participants. I can't see her name there. Okay, fine. She's, that's fine. If she's not there, that is okay. So in that case, then we will transit quickly to the discussion. I don't know if our ICT people have the poll results. I know the poll got a bit mixed up because when you ask for 250 characters, you can't do the word crowding. So we, yeah, just if you can just share the poll for the third question, which is in your own opinion, what is the biggest challenge to agricultural productivity or food production? If you could share that poll, uh, our, our ICT team, please. Uh, in the meantime, we shall be I'll, I, I don't know if our, our Esther is there. She's supposed to raise some of the questions from Q&A. Esther, as, uh, as we do the, uh, show the poll results, we want to, are you there? Yes, Jane. Geoffrey, please. Thank you. Geoffrey, we want you to project the poll before we go to the Q&A for the panelists. Geoffrey, if you may, please. Yes. Are you uh, Robert, uh, Robert is the one doing it. Okay, Robert. Robert, I know we ended up talking about 250 characters and that uh, doesn't, uh, may not. Robert, can you project the poll results, please? Yes, I'm working on it shortly. Okay, while he's working on it, Esther, you could uh, as uh, continue to, you can start to, to raise some of the questions. I also have some, if you may, please, Esther. Thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you, our participants for the active uh, engagement and interaction, raising your questions. I think uh, most of the questions have dwelt uh, or there are quite a number, particularly concerning about uh, the, 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 the safety, the health impacts. And I see a lot of questions that are asking whether there are actually any studies that are carried out to really check or evaluate the impacts of GMO on, on, on human health. 
as, uh, as far as we know, uh, in terms of medicine and everything, there is quite an elaborate process through which uh, these are tested, preclinical trials and then clinical trials to see whether they are safe for use in humans. Uh, I, I see a lot of questions dwelling on the uh, impact and especially on human health. So I don't know whether it is- uh, Okay. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Kamugira or Edewa, someone who can really shed light for participants exactly what it involves uh, to declare foods uh, safe, these GM foods are safe for human consumption. Thank you. So I can see the, the poll results are being projected there. Uh, and I can, Madam I can see- Madam uh, Facilitator, Professor yes. Jane. Yes. I can see Lydia, Lydia Kemani is asking to be upgraded to a panelist. I think she was uh, logged in as a participant and therefore was not able to, to participate oh. as a panelist. Uh, so somebody can assist so that uh, since she okay. is in our poster and has been uh, shown okay. as one who will be <laughs> saying something, uh, please okay. up, uh, upgrade her so that she can make a contribution as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Dr. Mugira. So, uh, Geoffrey, please upgrade uh, uh, Lydia Kimani. I don't know how come she was not upgraded because that she must have registered. And as you do that, we this is our poll results. We can see uh, you were looking at what, in your own opinion, what are the... Uh, uh, Robert, can you make it? It's like we need to see all the... All, the entries. So in your own opinion, what is the biggest challenge to agricultural productivity? So we can see, uh, you know, everybody's talking about climate change, climate change, uh, structural issues, which is an issue of poor markets, uh, over dependence, uh, or, you know, on rains and season that still ties to the climate change. So it looks like, uh, just like a, a, a Catherine highlighted in her presentation, that the thing that is actually limiting, uh, which is like consensus from many of the polling, the people who poll is climate change. Uh, so this is what we need to address. So we need to look at, as we embrace our GMOs or technology, we need to look at it from, I know Professor Mian already said the fact that, uh, you know, GMO is not just a blanket reference. It's a GMO is, um, you know, is, is the, the intervention is targeted. We are addressing a pest issues. We are addressing a water use issue, like uh, some of the maize varieties that are being re released. So clearly, what is we we're being told here is a question of climate change. But when climate change comes, what does it come with? What are those? You know, is it water stress? Is it the new pests that are coming? And is what is it that an issue of climate? Because climate change in itself is not also just one problem. Is a myriad of things that come with climate change. And how can we use, how are we gonna use, uh, you know, technology like GM technology to address the challenges to productivity that come with climate change. So we can see that is coming through. So there's also other, and Prof, we have lost you. It seems like your audio is breaking, Prof. It's about, uh, um... Prof, we have lost you. We can't hear you now. Sorry, it was all those are issues, but what we have now, audio. Sorry. but can you hear me well now? Can somebody con confirm if it probably means that my you yeah. can hear me now? No. Oh, yes, no, yes, yes, Jane. I think we've lost Jane again. Probably I could request uh, Dr. Mary Mwale uh, uh, coming from the government and uh, knowing that they are probably tasked with the, with the, with the policies. You could help us uh, probably understand what's the government doing to address uh, 
climate change and some of the issues that we face, I know that um, it's probably all, uh, you know, researchers included, scientists included to find solutions to this problem. But is there a government uh, policy plan on how to address climate change now that uh, it's one of the things that a lot of people realize that it's uh, a major hindrance to sustainable agricultural production? Thank you. Thank you. Can you, hear me? can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mary. Okay. Uh, currently, okay. Okay. So, Doctor, um, Doctor, Doctor Mwale, uh, um, Robert, you can stop sharing the screen now, uh, please. So that uh, we we yeah. and then uh, Dr. Mwale, you have a lot of echoes. I don't know if you can hear me. There's echoes from your side, but uh, maybe in because we don't have much time. Maybe just in two minutes you can address that issue. What government is doing? Because we realize that is the key issue affecting. Okay. And well, so what government at, is doing uh, yes. at the ministry? We have the we already have a climate smart strategy in place, and uh, we also have a lot of climate uh, smart uh, initiatives that are already taking place. So there are, there are those which are aligned within the ministry, the State Department for Crops and others for livestock. So all over the country, we have adopted climate smart strategies across board. So we have a dedicated unit. So I wouldn't really go into the exact uh, issues of how it is being implemented, but we have a policy and action plan and strategies for addressing the climate change effects already in place. Thank you. So just to follow up on the question from Esther, is uh, I do you think That's that uh, yes, that is as far I'm, I'm just asking asking you a you follow up question. Me. We can hear you, Mary. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm asking in terms of that uh, strategy, uh, we have the new varieties that, that uh, have are going to be released as part of the government uh, plan to introduce G GM maize especially into the country is a part of the strategy. Are these varieties that are coming, um, that have been introduced, uh, have they been factored in? Are they climate resilient? I mean, are they like drought tolerant or something? I just want to understand if that is part of the strategy, that the maize varieties that are coming are drought tolerant or have aspects that will address the biggest challenge that we have seen is, is facing our, our, our productivity. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, you've had some of our experts speak on this forum. Uh, the studies that have been going on by Calro and Kefis and also by the by, uh, biotech, uh, uh, biotechnology, uh, biosafety authority, they have worked together to ensure that uh, we have adequate seeds that are addressing this. So with the CALRO, we have the drought tolerant, uh, pest resistant uh, varieties that are being, uh, have been introduced. The, as you've heard from the experts here, they have uh, discussed how they are, the work that has been going on over 20 years to try and uh, produce uh, plants with traits that are adaptable to climate within, uh, within the dynamic environment we are in. So it's a continuous process. And these uh, varieties that are being pro introduced are produced, uh, like Calro is introducing the new BT varieties uh, early next year. But uh, there are some which have been going on uh, by Calro, like the Katumani, the other hybrid varieties, which are being multiplied uh, for purposes of uh, increasing their uptake within the farming systems. So generally we have the institution, dedicated institutions which are conducting research and also adopting and multiplying these seeds for use within the uh, within our food systems. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you that. So we basically, there is a, there I understand from the price release that came from uh, DG Calro that three varieties of maize are going to, to be introduced. Uh, and so that is, so that, that uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Mogira, uh, the, 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 the issue of, if you look at the charts that have come through, you know, the, you know, everybody is still raising that question of, uh, of safety and, you know, just ensuring that knowing that people, 
it, we, we are safe. So we, I think you, you tr almost, it's almost been said that uh, we, we are safe. So the question is, I know there's a NBA has a, you know, the, we have a, a mechanism or they have, we have regulations in place, uh, which uh, are meant to actually, you know, protect uh, the consumer because clearly there are people who may not want. So I don't know, Dr. Mugira, on that, on the take on safety, on safety of the produce, because everybody is asking this question. We are being told the food is safe. I know the food is safe. But then there's also the, the, the people on the other side who are saying that, uh, you know, this food is not safe. So, but neither of these two groups are, are giving us sufficient evidence uh, that uh, the food is either safe or unsafe. I know we, there are studies, uh, you know, the, the, the FEMA's uh, study, the Seralini study that was uh, retracted. But I'm just wondering, uh, do we, since, is there evidence? I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but the question of safety is being asked. Is there evidence, a study that is there showing that people or animals that ate GMO purely in it, it was safe. Do we have those studies anywhere? For or thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Jane, thank you, facilitator. Indeed, um, I have seen the, the chats that are coming through. I wasn't able to read all of them, but the concern is coming out quite clear. And that is the concern that came up when this technology became possible. And that is what informed the international community coming together and uh, under the auspices of the Convention on Biological Diversity, negotiating the Katayana Protocol on Biosafety. And that is why we are established. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we are established to ensure and assure. I think the, the part that is not uh, very well done or very clear to everyone is the part of assuring, because one of the uh, threads that we have been um, uh, explaining to, to the public, of course, recalling that I'm, I'm a regulator and not a promoter, is to say that uh, the last 26 years or so of experience in the use of GM products, there has been no uh, credible report that associates uh, this technology with ill health, either in humans or animals, or even negative impact of the environment. The only publication that came close to that was that of you, you have mentioned of Professor Celarini and his team, and which was uh, quickly later pulled down for reasons that uh, we may not have time to explain here, but it was mm. found not to be sound science. So, and you know, as, uh, as scholars or as, uh, as people who read uh, scholarly papers, when a publication is pulled down from a publisher, it tells a big story about the kind of quality of science. Uh, mm -hmm. So the study was discredited. There has been no other that has shown um, evidence and credible evidence of uh, negative impact on human animal health or the environment. I must be quick to say, my facilitator, that um, we deal with each of these products on a case by case basis. It is not possible to say that everything is safe or everything is not safe. So when we take BT cotton, for example, or BT maize, we ask ourselves what protein has been introduced? Does it have any resemblance to allergens or to toxic substances uh, after feeding animals? What happened to the organs? You know, it is a case by case basis. So essentially, just like you have put it, uh, Prof, that um, you are uh, you are sure, but you need to be assured. And I think this is the thread that came through from um, the facility the participant I mentioned earlier called Edawa. And I think what we have not done uh, to the satisfaction of the public is, or even to our own satisfaction is uh, communication. That which is supposed to uh, tell the world and tell and convince the public that indeed what we have checked and confirmed that it is safe, it is indeed safe. And this stems also again, uh, by the, uh, Professor, is um, uh, on, the, on the aspect of trust in our local institutions. So we need to build trust to know that uh, 
uh, we have checked and we confirm that it is safe. So uh, that is the farthest I can go, but I, I admit that quite a bit of communication and communication and communication again. Thank you very thank you. much, Prof. Th thank you. So, Dr. Roy, as you as you, I let you go, you think about the need to because at the end of the day, people want evidence. So you might want to. Uh, I know you previously worked with Nakosti, and and yeah. So consider. I mean, because people are saying. I, I know. I, I will repeat this that, uh, and Professor Miano alluded to this. The fact that you see, we we need we need evidence, and evidence somebody has to pay for that research. And sometimes, even though the funding people are genuine, everybody will say, "Who funded your research?" It is the people who are producing G, uh, you know, GM seed and everything. So your, your findings are biased. So we need independent studies. And, and so we, sure. we, we, we may want to do this, Dr. Roy, and you sure. think about it, you'll give me an answer. Do, are you willing mm -hmm. to fund independent studies to, to have our own data that we can communicate and let the public know that, hey, this study was done in Kenya by Kenyans, by the Kenyan mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. uh, funded, mm -hmm. I mean, Ke Kenyan government funded project where we can have study without bias. And then we sure, can sure. confidently <laughs> talk about our, our own evidence. Uh, think oh, about oh. it. Think about you it. Hit it. Uh, you don't you need hit to it respond. quite well, 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 Prof. And I'm glad that you can recall my previous station at Nakosti, where yes. I was part of the team that developed the national research priorities, recognizing that uh, our research is funded largely by partners, and therefore um, we had no space to determine our priorities. So we developed a publication in 2019, which set out our national research priorities. We also set up the National Research Fund, and I can confirm that the lab that is doing some starting work in biotech today in Kenyatta University was entirely funded by the National Research Fund of Kenya. So we want to get to that space where we can fund our own business and we can do our own business. I agree with you, Prof, and thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, Professor Mogira. So I, I, Lydia had not talked. Eh? Lydia, I just want to inquire as you you introduce to ask uh, because one of the things that because uh, I know you are in issues of trade, uh, one of the thing that has been raised uh, by by stakeholders the fact that you know as we legalize as we allow GM into the market, how is it going to affect our trade? How is it going to affect our? I mean, you can imagine the 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 the, the, the fact that you know some people we have our trading partners in the EU and some of the EU countries are totally anti-GMO. And so, do you think this uh, is that we're going to have any negative impact on trade? Uh, you know, external trade. Even our farmers. Some farmers have expressed the fact that. Uh, as we allow GM, which is local, low cost production, as, as, as has been alluded, uh, the GM is, is a little cheaper. What does it mean for our farmers? Are we going to negatively affect trade or our farmers business as we introduce GM? Uh, Lydia, in, 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 in a, it, we are actually out of time. Uh, kindly allow us just a few minutes so we, we conclude. Lydia, I have to give you time to respond as you introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jin. I'm Lydia Kimani, and I'm a private sector development specialist trained as an agricultural economist. So yes, indeed, of course, it's going to be uh, interesting uh, dynamics when it comes to the issues of trade, because you have a large trading partner who is very pronounced on issues of GMO. And then we also have, uh, we are looking at uh, going into a trade uh, partnership with another trading partner who is equally large, the US, and they are very strong on GM. So these are going to be very interesting uh, uh, dynamics to look at, and they, especially looking at a developing country context where like rightly has been pointed out in the chat, we have significant structural issues that would impede our successful adoption of GMOs. So you find that when we have significantly developed capacities in the public sector, in terms of regulating GM, G, GMO products, the uh, complementary capacities are lacking in the private sector. And this can be dated back to the implementation of structural adjustment programs. So meaning if we're going to successfully adopt and implement GMOs in the country, uh, uh, we need to look at uh, how have other developing countries done it, Argentina, China, 
uh, you find that in China, they have invested heavily in their research uh, and development. So where they have had um, developed uh, constructs that compete with multinationals. So as a result, this brings down, down the cost of prices because GMO products are proprietary products. So they come with intellectual property. And we need to ask the question, do our farmers have the capacity to pay for these kinds of GMs? I know we are saying we are promoting locally uh, produced GMOs, but do we have, have we developed the infrastructure, the institutional framework to facilitate commercialization? commercialization? Or once the ban, um, uh, once we go into commercialization, are we opening up and creating a market for other producers? So ideally this particular policy move should create opportunities for Kenyans, but given the gaps that we have experienced, then you find that this may this may also be a uh, this may be pose a significant challenge. Then also we have seen the issues of communication, but these also again are repeated by the austerity measures that the government is experiencing because of the debt distress that we are facing. We also have um, the issues of economic recession as a result of the pandemic, meaning that the past that the, by the, the government is operating on is very tight. And therefore, they, uh, what, what we call, um, we are going Dutch as a country. So where does the budget for sensitization, massive creation of awareness come from? So these are some of the things that are going to pose serious challenges. On issues of climate change, while it has been very uh, progressive in terms of uh, adopting GMs, you look at when you look at the case of the US, 16 years into adoption of the GMOs, they are now facing the issues of resistance and have to use very toxic and uh, toxic uh, chemicals to contain the resistance. And this has a cost implication. So the question we need to ask ourselves is that have we done su sufficient research to warrant us to go into this direction? So perhaps maybe reverting to the case by case basis is a safer way as a developing country. Um, to allow us to develop our institutional capacity, invest in research and development, ensure that intellectual property regimes are fair so that we are not um, and are disadvantaging farmers. We find that a lot of them are informal and therefore are, are used to seed saving. GMO uh, technologies uh, prevent that because of the terminator genes that require them to buy uh, seeds every time they have to plant. Do they have the capacity to do that given the high cost of production? These are some of the questions that need to be raised. In terms of implementing, are we facing uh, on, on a climate change perspective? Are we facing the challenge of maladaptation that 10, 15 years into adoption of these uh, uh, products, are we looking at a case where we are, we, and because of the monoculture way of production, are we facing uh, amplified situations of uh, nutrition insecurity? and also our uh, ability to not be able to feed the growing populations that are anticipated to uh, exponentially expand uh, in the coming years. So these are some of the questions that we need to really interrogate going forward and given the context of a developing country. That, and thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Sorry, uh, participants, we really are out of time and we may not have uh, the elaborate discussions we have anticipated. So I'm going to just, uh, as we have uh, Geoffrey, as you post the last poll question, I'm going to just uh, ask our panelists. I know some of them haven't posed a question. So I'm going to start with Dr. Edewa uh, to give because uh, the issue, because the question I was going to ask about safety, uh, Dr. Mugira has somehow alluded to it. And the one I was going to ask Dr. Professor Miano about, uh, you know, these uh, these varieties. Maybe you can answer that as you go, because there, there is the 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 concern about. Uh, I mean, why don't we ensure that what we have already, uh, you know, we just ensure that farmers. Uh, you know, use the right inputs to uh, to get yield. Well, I'm talking about maize here because already we have. I checked the other time. Uh, we have over almost 400 varieties of maize in the market already. There are three that are coming as GM. Uh, but the question people are: Why don't we invest in ensuring that farmers, uh, you know, produce this that we have already? using the right inputs, ensure, because it's all about limited inputs sometimes and lack of water that causes the yields not to, to, to be realized. So uh, Dr. Miano, Professor Miano, as you give your party shot, you just, uh, if you could highlight for us, I mean, that we out of these varieties that we have already, right? Why do we think that the three that have been, that we are starting with as introduction, uh, 
will cause there are many challenges that are facing production of those varieties. Do you think they are going to survive what the other hybrids cannot survive? Uh, you know, as you give your parting shot, you, the one minute, then I'll go to Dr. Idewa. Uh, we still want to hear more about food uh, safety. How, how, what do you think is that thing that we need to do to assure the public that, G, I mean, the food that we, we're going to produce, whether it is uh, we import or we're going to produce, it is safe. Uh, some of it has been answered by Dr. Uh, Roy, but yes. So Dr. Professor Mianu, as you do your parting shot, and then you have Dr. Dewa, and then all the other panelists, you'll give me your one minute parting shot uh, as we conclude, because time is up. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Ambuko, for giving me this chance. Uh, number one, what I would want to say is that um, one of my biggest concerns is who we believe in. And some of the information and perceptions that we have might have also been created by whom we had talking first. So, and I think it would be good for us to be um, genuine and look at ourselves and say, even when we are saying that some people have been a maybe bought and look at it sincerely and say, is it true that uh, whatever we are saying is because of what is that we know? That's number one. Number two, I want to talk about, uh, the, before I come to your question, is about the terminator gene. And the fact that people are saying that the seeds may not germinate, they will not grow and all that, which is also not correct. Because uh, one of the things that I would want the listeners to do is to go and check in the products, GM products which are in the market, which one has the terminator gene? so that we can say that the things cannot germinate or they're not going to be grown again and all that. So the utilization of the technology is maybe the one that is just the way we are talking about the hybrids and I see the discussions have been there. So, and so before we draw words and kind of mix in the discussions, it's good for us to have the proper information. And for example, that issue of the terminator gene, it would be good for one to first of all, go and check again and see which of those crops which are in the market that we are saying that they have the terminator gene. So the other thing is about the varieties. So um, Professor Abuka, I want to repeat again that um, we have not said that those varieties that are there <clears throat> cannot be used. They should be used. And we should go ahead and make sure that we improve our production through whichever means that we are going to use. And use of GM technology is not a blanket case issue. And I would want us to move from it from that point and say that out of the varieties that we have, the challenge that that variety could be having, it could be water, it could be pests, it could be fertilizers, and all of those things need to be addressed. But should you have an issue that can be addressed by using the, 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 the GM technology, why not use it? So, and this is why I still go back to saying that uh, when you look at it, don't look at it from the blanket view of saying that uh, we are going to plant all G the GMs and everything else. What is it that is being addressed? So that then eventually we will see the need and the, the, the need for the technology for that particular purpose, but not for the replacement. So the use of the varieties, let's use the varieties that we have. Let's improve on our production systems. Let's reduce the wastage that we have. Let's reduce the, the spoilage that could be minimized. But should there be a challenge that we can address using the technology, we use it. But we are not stopping any technology from being used, nor are we replacing anything. We are only addressing specific issues where need be. And then the, 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 the last point that I would want to, to say is about trade. You also look and see what is it that you are saying that is hindering trade? Because these commodities are very, very specific. And the question is that uh, what is it that if, for example, you have said that you are going to introduce whichever crop for, which is, um, has um, genetic te technology being used, where are we selling this? Where, who is saying that is not going to buy these products from us? So that then, instead of looking at things from a very blanket view, we be very specific because the use of this technology is the principle of case by case. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Prof, for highlighting. I think we needed a whole presentation from you. But uh, okay, so Dr. Idewa, in your, because this is your parting shot as I head to the others, uh, issue of food safety, because uh, it's still uh, this that if there's any elephant in the house, is the issue of food safety. In as far as GMs are concerned, uh, your parting shot as you highlight that 
where do we go from here on matters food safety? I want to eat, I want to eat uh, GMO from a point of knowledge. I need to know that I'm eating GMO. Uh, is, is that something that should concern me? Uh, or should we just assume that, well, it is safe whether it's GMO or not GMO? Should we ensure that everything is labeled and so that we make informed choices as consumers? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think this subject called food safety, as you know, I mentioned earlier, it's a science, but uh, in most cases, it's spoken by lay people. Likewise, even this uh, GM uh, technology is a science, but uh, the most passionate concerns are coming from lay persons. And with science, evidence and data matters a lot. It calls for clear systematic assessments that provide information that can be verified, data which uh, can be supp that supports decisions, and that uh, science should be used as a, a tool for development, for improvement of the quality of life, not to be seen as a threat. I think there are many perceptions in the room, and the uh, much as Dr. Mugia has spoken about other safety concerns, particularly in terms of for the um, other safety concerns, from a food safety perspective, it's really important to understand that food safety is not in the definition of what we're talking about here in most of the times. Uh, that's why I narrowed down on specifics, two issues that pertain to food safety. Food safety has to do with hazards chemicals or microorganisms in the food, which are carried on the food, with potential to cause an adverse health effect, or the condition of the food itself in terms of containing some toxins or certain substances that may then lead to uh, an adverse health effect to the consumer. Now, um, having spoken about this, uh, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that GMO has, has demonstrated a positive impact on reducing some of the contamination that may have uh, led to higher risks in the food that is consumed, normally present in the conventional production through use of chemicals. And we all know about uh, the very high cancer cases right now uh, within this country and our neighboring countries about uh, the exposures uh, due to the chemicals themselves. And it's really important uh, as a key message to uh, the listeners here that uh, we portray this, that uh, uh, food safety is about assessing then the presence of these hazards and if their presence at all warrants um, a concern that leads to an official control uh, by government through a regulation or some, some kind of uh, inspection and approval process that then clears goods before they are consumed. As, so, as has been demonstrated so far, and again, I, I, I come back to the question about how do you carry out these trials? You know, if, if there are no people poisoned, you cannot carry out this assessment. You cannot deliberately harm people in order for you to come up with the evidence that people have been harmed by eating GM foods. This is the this is this is the whole reason why the trials only have taken place through other post methods like use of laboratory animals to see how this then happens, and uh, to determine whether any reactions will then be of concern to human health as well. Okay. And uh, I rest to concern there for the toxicity, the possibility of toxicity which needs to be assessed scientifically, and the possibility of the allergenicity, allergens cause reactions, even under normal circumstances, even in the conventional of food, it happens. But mm -hmm. does not necessarily itself make the GM foods more risky than the conventional ones. In fact, many of the problems in food safety we have today in our country have to do with the conventional foods that we sell outside there. We don't okay. want to have the same issue in the GM foods. And so comparing this as a food safety expert, uh, I gave a conclusion earlier and this is for your consideration that it, there is currently no supportive evidence scientifically through credible scientific studies to demonstrate that GM foods are unsafe compared to the conventional ones. And so the key message is, please for the consumers, let us enjoy our food. 
let us say, uh, uh, embrace the technology to enhance food security. And for our farmers, please, let, let us have a, a, a positive approach in terms of seeing how else do we address the other concerns beyond food safety. So if the use of pesticides have been reduced, it's already a positive impact towards enhancing food safety at the farm level. If biofortification can be done through GM, it's already a positive impact at the industrial level, at the food processing level, it's already a positive impact. And so we need as a, um, experts here to be able to communicate these messages in simplicity and to trust our own scientists, our own children, brothers and sisters whom were sent out to school to study science. We need to believe in our scientists. This is the key message. Please, let's Thank trust you. our scientists. They are Thank not you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Edeva. Yes, let us believe in our science. That's the, your, your parting shot. So I'll get, I'll, we've finished, but I need to give uh, uh, Noah, our farmer, your parting shot, uh, then Dr. Mogira, your parting shot, and then uh, Mary, your parting shot. One, it is one minute, please, one minute, because we are. We, are, we have exceeded our time and people are already complaining. One minute, please, uh, Noah, if you may. One minute. And then Mary, Dr. Mary, one minute. And then Roy, one minute. And then we wrap it up. And then James, one minute. And then uh, we have uh, our tie-up messages from, 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 from Anna. Thank you. Is Noah still with us? If not, we can uh, we can uh, if we can get uh, Mary your parting shot one minute please, or take away your parting shot for the audience, and then we can have Roy. Thank you, and okay. then Catherine. I forgot Catherine is also there. Your parting shot. Okay, thank you, Chair. One yes, minute, my, please. Thank you. Yes, my parting shot is that uh, as a country, we are in urgent need to address the food insecurity we are facing. Our production is going down while our population needs are increasing. So we need to address this urgently. We are listening to the scientists. We should trust the scientists, as a former panelist has said. We should trust evidence that is coming from them. If there is going Thank to you. be anything that is going to emerge, they're going to let us know, and we shall make the necessary action. So for the time being, uh, we should be focusing on improving nutrition, avoiding waste, and improving production, whatever Thank it takes, and also adapting to climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mary. Catherine, your parting shot, then Roy, then James. My parting shot is that we are certainly facing ch challenges in agriculture in Kenya. Look at the drought, look at people dying in Massabit. So instead of just making a lot of noise, let us focus on how well we can look at these challenges and actually produce food for food and feed security in Kenya. Thank you. All right, so uh, James, if you may, one part in short, one minute, please. Um, so I guess uh, my part in short would be every single GM crop is regulated at the event level, which means uh, a full safety assessment is done on each event. This includes environmental uh, and food safety, there are established, uh, recognized uh, methods we have in place to, to perform these assessments. Um, and and this, is, this is done on each crop. And I see a lot of questions being raised in the chat relate to you know, lack of trust um, mm. with the scientists that are doing the work. So there's going to have to be a lot of transparency and and how you do these assessments and address the fears that are being raised um, mm. in the chat. At the same right. time, though, there's a lot of misinformation that can be addressed up front. You know, like the Terminator technology has never been commercialized anywhere in the world. Uh, mm. uh, it, it has not been applied. So, like th that narrative that there is the use of the Terminator gene is just just not true. You know, so there is some misinformation that can be addressed up front. Uh, yep. and maybe communicated up front. And, that, and that's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Information is power. Dr. Roy, uh, your parting shot as we wrap. I don't know if I've left anybody else with a parting shot. Yes. Thank you. Roy thank, thank you very much. Jane. 
Roy is here. <laughs> oh, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, I didn't leave. Uh, she asked me to stay on. I was uh, I was double tasking or tasking tasking. Yes, uh, my parting shot has been uh, taken away by uh, Dr. Edawa, and uh, the building confidence in our own institutions. I have seen comments that have come through the chat box that are reasonably almost personal, which is unfortunate, but uh, uh, the concerns are real. And I would want to say that uh, the farmers know their needs. Do, do, let us not imagine that the farmers do not know. They know what their needs are, and they need to have a say in how such needs will be addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Edawa. And what was the name of the farmer, Joshua, or there? Noah, Noah Nasiali. He looked like he Noah dropped Nasiali. off. Yes. I, I want to invite Noah and, uh, and uh, Edawa to reach out to us. I would like to have a conversation with them so that we can continue building this confidence and assuring the people that indeed what we're doing, we are checking on safety. Thank you, Madam Facilitator. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, the presenters. I know we're way out of time, but you can see this is a topic that uh, needed a whole week workshop, but uh, we've tried uh, to scratch the surface. So I'll ask one of my team members uh, to Esther, is it, was it Esther or Anna, to give us just the summary as we get Sylvia to project, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, engagement of youth in GMO uh, in the G in this uh, space. So, uh, Sylvia, if you may, you could uh, project uh, as uh, Anna. Is it Anna or Esther who is going to give us the the closing, uh, the fine? I mean, the takeaway messages. Sylvia, please. Anna, please. Is it Anna? Yeah. Anna first. Okay, Anna. Mm -hmm. Anna, go on. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambuko for this opportunity. I really don't know what to say now that uh, the panelists have really done uh, justice to this uh, yes. topic. Um, however, I just want to say that uh, from where I stand, this is what came out very clearly for me, that the right to food is a fundamental human right. So if we do not have food, then we are doing injustice to people. The second one is that um, indeed production has been declining in Kenya over the years due to challenges that have been highlighted, not just by the panelists, but also by the participants. And uh, those that have uh, come in very handy are those to do with climate change, pests and diseases, and uh, soil fertility, post-harvest losses. So um, the concerns on the use of GMOs uh, are also still very real from the, uh, the, chat, uh, the chats that we've seen on the chat box. And uh, most of these concerns are really around sustainability of our food systems, health and nutritional concerns, and also intellectual property rights issues of GMOs. Um, the other issue that has come out from this uh, webinar is that uh, GM is truly not like a system of production, but rather a tool for breeders. And therefore, it just helps to enhance production uh, depending on specific traits addressed. So it should not be generalized like, you know, GMOs is not something general, but very, very specific. The other issue is that um, uptake of GM in Africa is still uh, very low from what we saw from the panelists. But research, a lot of research is still ongoing. And um, there is a need uh, for more studies to give uh, as evidence, especially on a local front. Um, and uh, there is a call for independent studies so that uh, we have evidence even when we speak about uh, GMs. Uh, on food safety, um, it came out very clearly that really <laughs> there is no evidence of health effects uh, because of consuming uh, uh, GM foods. And if there's that kind of evidence, it would be very good for us to uh, be privy to it so that uh, we can speak knowing that we are 
um, speaking not from myths but from from facts. Uh, the other issue that came out very clearly is that Kenya has a regulatory framework for GMOs. We have had uh, the panelists from South Africa and uh, our own uh, regulator here has said that that framework that he presented mirrors exactly what is being done in Kenya, looking both at uh, you know uh, risk assessments of the, the environment, on health, and also on social economics. And that there are very many different departments involved in decision making so that uh, it can assure uh, consumers of the safe use of, uh, of GMOs. However, the negative connotations about GMO is still very real and uh, there needs to be a lot of dissemination of knowledge to not just uh, consumers and uh, uh, the uh, uh, around consumers and scientists and the bodies, but all people, even uh, the farmers, because there seems to be little communication. I want to uh, finish by saying that somebody say, every good relationship is based on good communication. Can we Thank continue you. to communicate so that uh, we can embrace uh, or you know, make decisions that are, um, what do I say? Yes. Uh, yeah, we make decisions based on, on facts and not. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for really capturing it so nicely and uh, eloquently. I think that makes for a very good uh, takeaway for everybody. Uh, I hope everybody has. A, so I'm going to give this uh, opportunity to Sylvia one minute to just uh, talk about this uh, 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 competition for youth. Uh, please quickly, Anna. I mean, not Anna, Sylvia, one minute, please. As uh, uh, Esther, is it Esther who is giving uh, the, 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 the closing remarks and way forward? Uh, okay. Yes. Sylvia, Thank please. You. Thank you very much, Professor Ambuko, for allowing me to share with the audience uh, what our company has for the youth to contribute to this important discussion. My name is Sylvia Waidera. I'm an agribusiness management graduate from the University of Nairobi and the founder of Vida Insights, which is a research company driven by passion for youth inclusivity for social transformation. Our main focus is on food security, and we aim to break the biases on agriculture by the youth. And we do this through sensitization campaigns and training and knowledge sharing platforms that will engage the youth. So we have recently signed a collaborative agreement with the Food Security Center at the University of Nairobi to increase youth engagement in food security matters. And like Professor Hutchinson said, we are leaving no one behind. So I've had a lot of diverse views about GMO. And uh, we want to take uh, to ask our youths to participate by doing more research and putting forward their creative articles under the theme, is GMO food the solution to food security in Kenya? And while at it, they can win themselves some great prizes that they can use to further advance their research and their interests. We are working with the team of experts from the Food Security Center that will adjudicate the articles, and the winners will be announced in our consecutive webinar that will be publicized. So I will uh, share this uh, poster with the organizers of this webinar and uh, they will be able to share with the audience and we can circulate it within your networks. We are working with stakeholders so that even other great articles that may not be part of the top three will also be highlighted in uh, our local media and the voices of the youth on this particular topic can be heard. So I know my time is up, but thank you for organizing this great event. And it has, not, it has been very informative and I do look forward to such platforms for knowledge sharing in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sylvia. If you have the link, you can post it in the chat so that people can also have access to it. Eh? Uh, so finally, I'm gonna ask Esther uh, to give us uh, the, the closing remarks and way forward and uh, close the chapter. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening for, I mean, we've extended by, uh, I don't even want to count the minutes, but uh, forgive me for extending the time. Esther, please, thank you. Sorry, on behalf of the organizers, 
the Kenyan chapter of the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development and its partners, the University of Nairobi, Taro, Arts, and JKU Arts. I take this opportunity to thank you all. In particular, I want to thank our speakers. Thank you so much for honoring the invitation, for preparing your presentations. Thank you so much for giving us very useful insights. Thank you so much for unpacking GMOs. So I want to appreciate Professor Margaret, Dr. Taracha, Dr. Obogo. I want to appreciate Dr. James Roth. I want to appreciate uh, Dr. Roy, Professor Miano, Dr. Mary Mwale, Dr. Andrew. I want to appreciate uh, Lydia Noah. And uh, thank you very much, our active participants. Thank you so much for the active engagement, for sharing with us your concerns, for asking your questions. And uh, I want to tell you that this is the beginning. I think uh, we are all Kenyans. We are trying to help uh, in finding solutions to pertinent issues. And agriculture is the backbone of our economy. It's uh, the only source of food we have. So it, I think uh, it's good to have these uh, kinds of dialogue, interactions, because we can only work together if we agree to work together. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to continue talking. We hear you, we see the diverse uh, you know, comments. And uh, I think uh, we, we, we read the perspectives of everyone across the board. We appreciate you. We thank you for your active participation. And moving forward, we want to have more of these dialogues, conversations, so that we can start unpacking each and every issue around GMOs being one of the pertinent issues uh, today in the meeting the sustainable food systems. So we request your active participation moving forward. I think we have realized that uh, if we have to have any meaningful discussion, we probably need to focus, to focus on one issue at a time. And uh, so look out for, I think, uh, some workshops we may organize, more webinars if it's possible, may face-to-face -face, uh, interactions for us to be able to discuss these uh, issues uh, further one by one. And we request uh, you and especially our panelists and our facilitators when we call upon you really to come engage because we have an opportunity really to talk to Kenyans. I think this one was the beginning. We wanted to educate, to create awareness and especially to the general public so that uh, as much as the discussion is going on, so they also get to know, to be informed. And when they have to make choices, then they make an informed choice. So from us, thank you very much. We appreciate, we are sorry about extending the time. You can see how interesting it has been. Please bear with us. Thank, thank you, you and until next time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you, Esther. Just before you all log out, these are the poll results on your screen. I know we, we were over 230 people. So some people didn't take the poll. Nonetheless, we have uh, moved the needle a little bit from where we started, at least the level, level of knowledge has increased a little bit. And just uh, one thing Esther forgot to say, we're going to package uh, the deliberations into some kind of position paper which we'll share with all the people that were in participation. And also we hope that these deliberations is, we've been told to communicate. So we'll continue communicating uh, and raising awareness. Thank you and uh, have a blessed uh, afternoon, everybody. Thank you all our speakers. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.